every day that goes by, we're getting more stability. I think Washington wants it to stop. I think barring any other major shocks, I think it's behind us. Nothing's broken. We've repriced a bit. Everything's working sort of pretty well. The underlying strength of the economy and the underlying strength of corporate balance sheets is still with us. We are still in a bear market and it's gone on for quite a long time. Let's be clear, the event over the last few weeks has been an equivalent to tightening. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz. What a difference a bull market makes. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio. Alongside Lisa Abramovitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. T counter Simon, he's going to be back with us tomorrow. Equity futures elevated again up four tenths of 1% on the S&P 500. The headline belongs to the NASDAQ 100. So it's been 20%, right, since the lows of last year. It's a bull market. We're back to that. It's up about 14% so far this year, poised for the best quarterly performance going back to the depths of the pandemic in 2020. Is this basically just whack-a-mole? Something sells off, you go buy it. Well, let's look at the banks, down more than 18% year-to-date on the KBW Banks Index. Let's look at the home builders. Now, we were squaring circles together last week. Let's try that again this morning. Square this circle. The home builders are up more than 13% and the banks are down 18. What do the home builders know that the banks don't? The home builders just had simply lost value. So you can might as well just go into them and buy them at that point because, you know, there's no knife that's really going to cut your hands when you fall it. But here's the issue. A lot of people think that the housing market has bottomed and that we've already seen the trough in terms of how much, at least residential, not necessarily commercial, but residential. You started to see mortgage rates creep lower. You started to see volumes go up. I even got a call the other day saying, are you planning to sell your home? Because we've had a lot of interest and there's really tight inventory. Yeah, there's still like that kind of energy. Is that a New York thing though? I have not gotten one of those in years, just to give you a sense. There we go. The rate cuts are coming. Exactly. Just around the corner. And so go go home builders. 100 basis points worth. And the Federal Reserve is not forecasting that whatsoever. It was interesting that the Republicans came out yesterday and said we've had a private chat with Chairman Powell and he's indicated one more hike this year. My first take on that was like, yeah, he just told you about the dot plot. Literally. <laughs> we, we all know what's in the dot plot. <laughs> yeah, that was one more hike for this year. He was like, here is everything that we just told everybody. They're like, let me tell you. We have private information. They're going to they're gonna potentially raise rates. We're going to get some data time. later, Lisa. Jobless claims. I know you're going to talk about that in a moment, but still expecting that to come in sub 200K. We went through the calendar yesterday. I think we need to keep returning to the calendar. April 7th, payrolls. April 12th, CPI. Nobody's talking about it. Nobody's talking about it at all. So when people start talking about this spread between the Federal Reserve and the market, the Fed saying one more hike, the market says 100 basis points of cuts just around the corner, what's going to resolve that spread if it's not the economic data? What will it be? I was wondering the same thing this morning, especially when we got European data showing that Spanish inflation came in substantially lower than expected. I went immediately to the German two-year. Does this mean that it's all clear? Does this mean that they're going to basically back away from some of the rate hikes? No. Not at all. You see basically flat. I mean, people are not responding to the economic data. This was the story last week. It's still the story this week, as we're expecting to get still a strong labor market. So at what point do we have to see the cracks to keep trading on them? I keep saying it. You keep saying it too. Are we waiting for the senior loan officer opinion survey? May 8th. Is that what we're waiting for? 100%. May 8th? Yes. You've got to wait until May 8th to get a decent understanding as to what's going to happen here. If there's another data point that confirms some narrative that seems to be a suspicion for people, then people will trade on that one. But until then, it's going to be May 8th. Because, I mean, until then, we're going to be looking for tea leaves. We're going to hear reports from specific idiosyncratic banks. I know that he said the I word. And then people are going to say, oh, my gosh, this means all clear. Or, oh, my gosh, this means banking crisis continued. And then they'll trade on that until there's data there. I mentioned some of the bank earnings as well. On the 13th, you get First Republic. On the 14th, I think you get JP Morgan. So the bank earnings are going to be in focus as we go into April. Equity futures right now on the S&P 500 positive by four tenths of one percent just to kick off the trading day with yields just a nudge higher a little bit higher not by much if at all 356.77 on a 10-year on euro dollar positive two tenths of one percent in a euro's favor stronger euro here lisa 108.63 a week a dollar this morning yeah and again that's been sort of a trend a persistent trend and we were talking yesterday with mark mccormick is this the u.s losing its exceptionalism the dollar or is this something perhaps larger we are watching those 8:30 a.m u.s initial jobless claims i was looking today at the unemployment rate going back to 2007 and i understand that 2020 really distorted it but i was really wondering how quickly does the unemployment rate go up when it starts to really creep higher and unless 
it's 2020, it does take some time, which makes me wonder, okay, at what point can we just say, this labor market is still robust, it's not distortions, it's not wrecked data. This is something that we're just not seeing in terms of the weakness that we're all expecting. And that's the reason why I think this uh, weekly data is getting more and more interesting. Today, perhaps we'll get some inter interpretation. Fed speak includes Richmond Fed President Tom Barkin, Boston Fed President Susan Collins, and Minneapolis Fed President Neil Kashkari. What can they possibly say? How are they going to illuminate this situation? So Kashkari, I think, was on the money through much of this year. Came out at the start of January and said 540 on Fed funds and wait. And now listen to him. It's not 540 on Fed funds and wait anymore. There's a real belief that what we've seen in the banking system is a substitute for more rate hikes. The problem is we haven't seen it yet. This is the problem. Know, and and we, don't, we have no sense of what this is going to do. So how do they give some insight into what they're looking for to confirm the belief that likely this will cause a tightening in credit conditions? I mean, this is really the messy part of this. And then at 3.45 p.m., Treasury Secretary Jenny Yellen is planning to speak at the National Association of Big Business Economics Conference in Washington, D.C. She's been pretty interesting recently. And I really am curious to hear what she has to say about the economy, about the state of banking and about credit tightening that she sees, that she's concerned about, because she probably has a better bird's eye view than anyone right now. You mentioned the news from the FDIC yesterday. Why do we call it a so-called special assessment on the industry? What's that phrasing about? You know, this is not unprecedented to have a special assessment like this. Let's just go around the banks and doing a whip around. It's, it's literally just taking a hat and put, being like, put some money in it's the, hat. the least politically vulnerable for us to ask you for money because you're big and you make money. So here, just you you guys should pay for it. And you've benefited from what's happened, arguably, arguably. in the last so, couple of weeks as well. So come on, just give us $23 billion. OK, make it sound easy. <laughs> Steve Schwarzman makes it sound easy too, doesn't he? <laughs> he just, that's the kind of guy that fools you with confidence after a banking crisis. Most of this is solvable. It's okay. Don't even know if I'd use that word crisis. We'll where, move on. Where was he speaking? Singapore? In Tokyo, I <laughs> In think. Tokyo. Yeah, yeah. Okay. No, honestly, I, look, I think a lot of people have come out and said that. We just don't know. And I think that that's the key and the reason why people are getting a little concerned about, you know, who to believe. My rule for a crisis, if you have to stay up on a weekend, on a Sunday evening, and all the regulators are getting together because banks are failing, I think that meets the definition of a crisis. If you do that one weekend, if you do that two weekends... I mean, we're there. Eric Friedman, CIO of US Bank Asset Management, joins us right now. Eric, good morning to you and welcome to the program. Always great to see you, sir. That rally we've seen in the Nasdaq, up more than 20% from the December low. Is that a rally you can get behind, Eric? Jonathan, not yet. We think it's really predicated upon the move in rates as, as being the primary driver right now. We do have a great opportunity to learn more about the tech sector in the next couple of weeks. And specifically, what we're looking for is evidence that companies are not hunkering down and and scaling back on capex, and and that's just information that we think is going to be is going to be quite fluid. So net net, we think that the you know the push towards cyber continues. With the push towards uh, big data is is certainly still there. But but things like DRAM, you've done a good job of covering the demand for chips and and other software services. So until we see that capex. Uh, push really stabilize or even improve. We, we're still not not buyers of technology here. Eric, you just said something really interesting that the rally that we have seen is predicated on the idea of rate cuts. Is that the entirety of it? Because a lot of people would disagree with that. I don't think it's the entirety of it, Lisa. I think that part of it is is you know some degree of the, the mean reversion trade. You've talked about home builders uh, not really rallying on on much of a fundamental story, but certainly rallying. Yeah, you know, we, we think it's probably too early to call this the 2020 playbook of rates declining and therefore anything that has a long duration earnings cycle uh, picks up. But I do think that's at least a partial explanation. You know, clearly, when you do have a downdraft like we had last year across not just big tech, but also uh, some of the more, more let's call it acyclical components of tech, uh, that does speak to a little bit of an asset allocation grab as opposed to a fundamental basis behind the move. So I think it's a partial explanation, Lisa, but not a, not a full explanation. How painful is it to be bearish on anything right now, Eric? Yeah, you know, I think, Lisa, it's it's like the playbook has been S&P 3,800, you get aggressive, you you buy S&P 4,200, you you, uh, you you ease up if you're on positions, you know, get to, to the same uh, range on the on the 10 year, three and a quarter to four and a quarter. So, you know, I think that for us as being a group that's been a bit more cautious, and again, we've been upping credit quality, upping duration. That's really worked. Uh, I think that some of the you know, the more uh, esoteric parts of, of of fixed income, so things like not agency mortgages, that's worked for us as well. But you know, I think this is in, a, in an area where you have to really manage your tracking here. Meaning, 
you know, in a, in a very trending market, despite all the all the chatter back and forth, 3,800, 4,200, that has been the blueprint. So, you know, getting outside of those ranges has has been to the asset allocators peril in this environment. So we think that's still the playbook to, to run with right now. Eric, at the moment, we're trying to work out what would break things out, how it would break out from that kind of range. Beyond that, also the spread between the Fed and this market, what's going to resolve it one way or the other? Lisa and I have spent the last week thinking about this. I'm sure you have as well. What does resolve that? Is it the traditional economic indicators over the next couple of months? Is it the senior loan officer opinion survey that we're waiting for on May 8th? Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> Eric, which one is it? Yeah, I think, Jonathan, we think you know, right now, clearly the financial sector is, is of, of primary focus. And, and I think that secondarily, and I think a very close second is the economic data. And that was a clear message from Chair Powell last week, that the economic data still matters, whether uh, you know, the daily news flow uh, suggests otherwise, we think that's key. So I do think the break either way, and this is probably one of the areas to, to really focus on, is what happens with small businesses. 70, 75 percent of the job openings right now are with companies below 250 uh, of headcount. And, and so seeing what credit flow looks like to those institutions, seeing what uh, you know, NFIB survey data suggests for, for keeping employees in seats, that we think will be the key. So I do think, interestingly enough, the last resolution, Jonathan, of the dot plot between the Fed and the market was won by the Fed. The Fed said, hey, look, we told you that inflationary pressures were going to be high. And they were. And I think the Fed said last week, look, we still think there's a bias towards persistent inflationary data. So uh, so pay attention to it in addition to the daily flows on, on the financial sector. So we do think that, that while a lot of focus is on the financial sector right now, economic data is a very, very close second. Eric, thank you, sir. As always, good to see you. Eric Friedman there of U.S. Bank Asset Management. May 3rd is the other date. Yeah. The FOMC meeting question we keep going back to, will we have sufficient information by the time we get to May 3rd for this Federal Reserve to make a call one way or the other? The fact that Eric pointed out that the Fed has been right and the market has been wrong before. Sure. There's always sort of this uh, mantra in markets that markets are correct. They're looking at the data, even if even if the headlines are not. And so the PCE data that we get tomorrow might be quite interesting at a time where we've continued to get relatively hot readings on inflation. Claims, payrolls, shrug his shoulders, move on. Uh, you unless can't, it starts unless to crack. Well, I mean, unless it, unless you don't, right? I mean, you don't know what's going to trigger the market. So potentially, I don't know. That's Sebastian gonna Page is going to join us a little bit later this morning. Lisa and I will talk to him about that. He joins us from T. Rowe Price. He'll be around the table in New York in the next hour. From New York City this morning, good morning to you all. Agrees higher. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. The Wall Street Journal says it's deeply concerned for the safety of one of its reporters who's been detained in Russia on spying allegations. According to the security service, FSB, American Evan Gershkowitz was detained in the city of Yekaterinburg and is suspected of espionage in the interests of the U.S. government. He was said to be collecting information about the Russian military industrial complex. In Kentucky, two U.S. Army helicopters collided Thursday night during a training exercise near Fort Campbell. Governor Andy Beshear says fatalities are expected. The helicopters were from the 101st Airborne Division. The FDIC is thinking about having big banks cover a larger than usual portion of the $23 billion hit from the recent bank failures. Bloomberg has learned that the special assessment on the industry will happen in May to shore up a $128 billion deposit insurance fund. The regulator is under political pressure to spare small banks. The president of Taiwan made a stopover in New York and called the island's future a test for the world. Tsai Ing-wen's trip may further escalate tensions between the U.S. and China. Beijing says the visit will have a severe impact on the relationship with Washington. The U.K. is set to outline its strategy to speed up the deployment of renewable power and capture carbon. It's being billed as a response to the green subsidies in President Biden's Inflation Reduction Act. But the measures in a draft document seen by Bloomberg News show little in the way of new spending. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg.
Anytime you have a, a bank failure like this, uh, bank management clearly failed, supervisors failed, and, and our regulatory system failed. I still think a tiering approach makes some sense. It doesn't have to be the same rules for all banks, but we do need stronger rules uh, for firms of this size. Stronger rules on capital and liquidity, I think, are going to be really important. That was Michael Barr, the Federal Reserve Vice Chair for Supervision over the last couple of days, testifying on Capitol Hill. You heard that line there, Lisa. Bank management clearly failed. Supervisors failed. Our regulatory system failed. Bank management clearly failed. They lost their job. Supervisors failed. And what's going to happen to supervisors? It's a great question, especially because a lot of people question whether this is... I mean, you've asked this question. Is it a regulatory issue or is it an enforcement issue? Is this something where it's just a failure to act under provisions where you had the capacity to act and the information to act? So then how do you solve that problem? And you've mentioned this too. He's probably not the right guy to be on Capitol Hill over the last couple of days because this wasn't really his story. I want to hear from Randy Quarles. And Chairman Powell. And Chairman Powell and what they're going to do, and they have an investigation. They're going to release it, I believe, in May sometime. You know, until then, all of the proposals that we're hearing, how much are they basically window dressing to say we're on this before we understand what actually happened? And how much does anything actually get off the ground versus basically papering over the issue with a feeling that, you know, we're on this? And we've joked that if you get a couple of days of gains in the equity market, this market will move on and it's like crisis over. What a difference a week makes. There was a real question that we asked a few times last week do we need to see real legislative action to resolve this? Do you need to change the insurance caps for deposits to address this? I don't really hear that being asked this week at all. Wait, just wait, because right now the big banks are on the hook to pay $23 billion. Let's hear what their response is. Let's hear how much there is suddenly a renewed push. OK, we're always part of the solution. We need to see X, Y, what and can Z. They say? I mean, well, OK, so what, they're going to just get strong armed? Don't know. I'm not sure how they can push back, and we can have that conversation in a minute. I'm not sure how much strength they have, what power they have to just turn around and say, no, we're not going to do that. So then what's the potential liability? Is it just basically free money for the government and they can do that anytime they want? I don't think any of this is free. I think ultimately that we're going to have to pay the burden for it. I would agree with that. I think that probably it'll get baked into fees and things of that nature. But where does that come into the conversation? I mean, I, this, is, this was one of my questions when I heard, it sounds really easy to say to the big banks, you guys have money, give us $23 billion. There are consequences. Oh, yeah. And what are those? And no free lunch at all. I was distracted for a moment out of the corner of my eye. AMH just came down the, the escalator in New York. Fantastic. Didn't know that. She'll be with us in the next hour. Looking forward to that. Equity futures just now up by about a half of 1% on the S&P 500. A lift in the equity market, in the bond market, basically unchanged on a 10-year, 357.34. And in the FX market, we had some Spanish inflation data a little bit later. Big downside surprise there, Lisa. Still the euro stronger, 108. People point to the fact that core still came in hot and it was entirely due to energy. But I do wonder how much that's going to start to lead the index lower, lead some of these indicators lower, considering that before people were saying higher energy prices has a percolating effect into the rest of the economy. Well, does it have the reverse kind of effect when it goes down? Let's get back to the banking system. Joining us now after two days of testimony on Capitol Hill from U.S. regulators, Mara Rodriguez Valadares, the principal at MRV Associates. Mara, let's start here. What did you learn? over the last couple of days? Well, I think we really learned that history matters. And this is what happens when we have such a significant decline in history majors, uh, because people forget things. They forget that basic interest rate risk management and liquidity measures are at the heart of being a bank. So there's certainly going to be some changes in terms of supervisory and on-site examination processes. But there's still a lot we don't know. Where is Greg Where is Greg Becker? He needs to be there. He is, at the end of the day, where the buck stops. Where were the board members? We haven't heard from any of them. They're the ones that are supposed to provide oversight. It's not the Fed or the California regulators that run the bank. So we still are missing from the whole range of cast of characters who were really responsible here. In the meantime, the bill we've heard is $23 billion that the FDIC incurred. It is not taxpayer-funded bailout. It is J.P. Morgan-funded bailout. How much is there going to be some sort of consequence to the major banks having a special assessment that leaves the FDIC whole? Right. And I can't imagine that J.P. Morgan, Citibank, all of the globally systemically important banks in this country are happy about this. Uh, it, they are not the problem. Uh, they're very, very liquid. They're very well capitalized. And they certainly don't have concentrations of deposits the way that SBB did. 
And then the other regional banks are certainly going to take a hit. I don't believe that community banks will. I think there is absolutely no political will on either side of the aisle to hit the community banks. But at the end of the day, it's going to be the American consumer who is going to take a hit because eventually when premium rise for banks, eventually it gets passed on to depositors. So this is this is not going to be any kind of free lunch for the regular ordinary American who had nothing to do with SVB's horrible mismanagement. You talked about history and sort of the lack of history majors. Greg Ipp in the Wall Street Journal wrote this column about how perhaps this isn't the same kind of 2008 financial crisis where it happens all at once, and rather it's a slow-moving crisis of smaller and medium-sized banks losing relevance and losing some of their preeminence in markets. Does that resonate with you? Unfortunately, it does. I think what we're seeing here is that you're going to have a wide range of investors, journalists, pundits who are now looking, okay, where's the next trouble spot? We have banks that have incredibly large portfolios of souring real estate loans. You also have leveraged companies that have very little in protection for the lenders. So there are some trouble spots there. They've been there all along, but with stock prices going up, investors were happy. The minute that you have a lot of volatility or you have stock prices going down, investors uh, rediscover the religion of good due diligence in terms of in terms of credit. So I think we're going to have a lot of dribs and drabs of, of these kinds of issues. People are now talking about uh, so-called odd accounting rules or or unusual accounting rules. No, those have been there all along. So you can move bonds around. You can also make all kinds of changes with non-performing loans and loan loss reserves. So I think every time that investors nitpick a bit more or journalists nitpick a bit more, they're going to find that there are some serious problems that still have not been resolved in the world of bank regulation, supervision and accounting. Murray, you know how this works. One week later, an equity market rally later. And the questions, the urgency just kind of dissipates. We've seen that over the last week. Mara, I mentioned this with Lisa a few times. Last week, the big question was, do we need legislative to change right now? What do we need to change? What do we need to do like in the next 24 hours? What do we need to change? I think what we need to change is to make sure that regulators, both statewide and at a federal level, are empowered to do their job. You need to remove heads of banks from being at the district bank. So try to remove those conflicts of interest. And you really need to take this, you need to change the structure. You need to empower both offsite and onsite examiners to do their job. The problem is that when any one of them steps up and tries to tell the truth, right, there's no incentive to do that. And you do need to make sure that those banks that are 100 billion and more are properly regulated and supervised. You do need to do away with the Trump rule, EGRR CPA, that de-designated or changed the definition as to what is a systemically important bank. Because those regional banks, by definition, are very concentrated and they are very important in those regions. And hopefully, this time around, politicians on both sides of the aisle have learned the importance of not watering down those regulations. That's implied by the very fact that a couple of weekends ago they had to use the systemic risk exception for these banks. Mara, thank you for joining us, as always. Mara rodriguez Valadares there of MRV Associates. Lisa, the last couple of days, what have you made of it? That people are looking to feel angry and they're not sure where to point their anger. That they're not sure what actually happened. They're not sure what's going to be politically feasible to really create a right solution. There's just sort of a mess and a lack of political will to actually make any changes that are going to have any lasting consequence. How many times have you heard this story where, let's say, a company is guilty of fraud and you find out they don't have a CFO? And you're like, how did that happen? Why did no one look? Or you find a bank that's been up to no good and they didn't have a chief risk officer for the best part of year. You're like, how did that happen? Then a bank goes under and you find out that they had a seat the leadership of the bank had a seat on the board of the, the regulator that was meant to oversee them. I mean, it makes sense to that for me. Well, I think that that's one of the reasons why it's a question mark why the CEO is not in Washington, D.C., answering some of these questions. How many other companies, not just banks, companies, have other perhaps red flags on their balance sheets? The city's Andrew Hollenhorst joins us next. Cuts in tech keep coming. Roku just moments ago across the Bloomberg, 200 employees to go, 6% 
of the workforce. I'll come back to that story in just a moment. From New York City this morning, good morning. Here's the shape of things in the market. Equity futures up by four-tenths of 1% on the S&P 500. We add some more weight to the NASDAQ, up another four-tenths of 1%. The NASDAQ 100 up more than 20% from the December low. I, I guess we've got to call this a new bull market. I guess. In the bond market, twos, tens, thirties look like this. Your two-year going into jobless claims in about two hours from now. Your two-year 4.08886% on a two-year. Let's just call that 4.1%. Yields in about a basis point. On a 10-year, 357.34. The tone in the bond market today set by Eurozone inflation data. Spanish CPI, big downside surprise. Yet still, the euro stronger against the weaker dollar more broadly through G10. Euro dollar shaping up like this this morning. Euro dollar 108.63. That's a stronger euro against the weaker dollar. But just to return back to that Roku story, Lisa, 6% of the workforce to go over at Roku. How much more of the excesses that were built up over the pandemic have to get beaten out of the system before we believe that tech has right-sized? And that continues to be a question. I like Roku. I've mentioned it before. I like that you can search for things rather than just sort of do roulette in terms of where things are. You're talking about but, me. Yeah, <laughs> but I think that <laughs> maybe. Um, but I, I think that, you know, there's a saturation factor and how many new devices do people really have to buy? And this has been sort of the existential question facing a lot of the pandemic darlings that now have to realize that the world is not going to be permanently glued to screens. I've repeated this question a few times, so forgive me for going in on it for the millionth time, maybe. Love it, please. Pandemic excess or the excess of the last 10 years? Doesn't some of this go beyond the excess of the pandemic and the pull forward of demand? Isn't some of it about what's happened in the last decade? Absolutely, without a doubt. With Roku, I think everybody was desperate during the pandemic for any entertainment in any way, shape, or form to deal with kids who were locked up at home. So potentially, there was a greater investment in Roku during the pandemic than perhaps in pre-pandemic times. Nothing personal about that. <laughs> Roku right now up by 2.6%. Not for the first time we've seen this. When tech starts talking about efficiency and cuts, I'm thinking meta which has been absolutely flying gear today, calling this the year of efficiency. Deliver the cuts. The market loves it. 70% gain so far this year. It's unreal. You know, bring that efficiency on, right? But at what point is there actually a business model question of how much more do you have profits to grow? And maybe you get some Fed rate cuts too. Ton of Fed speak on tap today. We'll hear from Barkin Collins Kashgari. Look out for that. City's Andrew Hollenhorst expects more hikes this year. Says the following, in a time of incredibly elevated uncertainty, we once again see markets as underpricing the level of policy rates this year and have maintained our base case for policy rates. Here's the number, wait for this, 550 to 575, despite an undeniably dovish March FOMC meeting, even with a 25 basis point hike. Andrew Hollenhorst, the man behind the note of City, joins us here in New York. Morning, Andrew. Hey, good morning. OK, make sense of that. 575 on Fed funds in the face of this. I, I think it's not hard to make sense of if you follow the inflation data. The big question is, are we going to have a Fed that's focused on financial stability issues or price stability issues? I think that's what we were talking about in the note in terms of the incredible uncertainty is it looks quite uncertain relative to whether we're going to get this focus on financial stability, which would be more dovish, or this focus on price stability, which would be more hawkish. In the last few days, it looks like things are stabilizing a bit. We're going to get some inflation data later this week. Um, maybe we start to move the narrative a little bit back towards price stability. Let's talk about duration mismatches, and not in the bond market and not at banks, just in terms of data and when we're going to find things out. We'll get inflation data on April 12th. I just wonder how long it's going to take to find out the financial stability issues. We're on the calendar and the mismatch this Fed's got to grapple with because the timeline's going to be all over the place. And if they choose financial instability, they might have to wait and wait and wait and wait. And you think they might have to wait until 2024 before they see the slowdown bite? It, it could really take some time before you see the slowdown coming in and affecting growth data um, and especially inflation data. If you think about the inflation data over the next three months, the next six months, it's probably going to come in essentially where it was going to come in before we had the issues in the banking sector. So they could really be waiting to see how this is going to trickle through and flow through the economy. Um, if you go back to where we were just a couple months ago, remember we'd had some months of softer core inflation prints, the Fed was sounding a bit more dovish. Well, then you basically had one month of data. You had a strong January and you had some revisions to the prior inflation data, and all of a sudden you had a more hawkish Fed. So we're trying to keep that in mind when we think about the Fed here, that you know, the, the volatility that we saw in two-year yields over the last couple of weeks, it makes some sense if you think that they were really moving between these two extremes, where it could be financial stability, that would be more dovish, or it could be price stability. And I, I think that really does mean that 
policy rates still need to get above five and a half percent. I love getting your notes. Over the past two weeks, I've loved it even more because I feel this exasperation as people basically say rate cuts, everything is over. And you're just like, stop it, guys, please stop it. Things are still hot. We still have an inflation problem. What kind of feedback do you get every time you pull one of these out? Yeah, so it's, it's interesting. I, I think we actually get a lot of resonance on this idea that inflation is still strong and underlying inflation is still strong. And where there's more of a question from clients is, does the Fed have the ability to respond to that strong inflation? And do they have the willingness to do it? Which, which is a really important question for the Fed, and I think a, a question that the Fed should be aware people are asking. Um, because one of the key things you want to do as a central bank is to provide that confidence that you have resolved to fight against higher inflation. I think the market really got there um, a month ago or so. We had two-year yields above 5%. Um, now there are new questions about whether the Fed is going to essentially have to give a little bit on the price stability mandate to focus on the financial stability mandate, um, that could be problematic if we start to view central banks as unwilling to move against inflation. How high could 10-year yields go if the Fed does pause, despite hotter than expected CPI, PCE, all of the data indicators that we had been watching before the financial stability questions? Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, we've been thinking about interest rates rising because policy rates are rising, but there's this other scenario where policy rates could actually stay lower and you could start to get longer term rates rising. I think Fed officials are feeling pretty confident about that right now, because if you look at longer term expectations of inflation in the market, five year forward, five year inflation break evens, um, well, those have stayed relatively stable, relatively consistent with mandate consistent policy levels. But th I think that's what they'll be watching. Um, if that starts gliding up, if you start seeing higher tenure yields because the Fed is being dovish, um, that would be a real concern for Fed officials. We've said a few times they're in the risk management business. May 3rd, they meet, decide. Are they going to have enough information to make the call to hike by the time we get to May 3rd? I, I think it's going to be a difficult meeting. Um, I think they, they will have enough information to continue hiking at that meeting. The question is, what guidance are they giving beyond that? And we saw what happened with the, the dots at the last meeting a, a week ago. Those dots that indicate where policy rates should be at the end of the year, I think there's no question they were going to move up at that meeting until you had the issue in the banking sector. So now the question we're asking about May is, well, they don't have to update those dots, but they have to give us some indication of, will there be further rate hikes or will there not be further rate hikes? I don't know that you can do again what central banks did a week or two weeks ago. If you remember the ECB hiking by 50 basis points and basically saying, we can't tell you where we go from here. I think in May, at that time, there'll be enough time to view the data, understand what's going on with financial stability, give some guidance. Will there be further rate hikes or will there not be further rate hikes? Uh, they'll have to make a decision. Well, the that. new line, I think, is additional policy firming. Additional policy firming, uh, wh right? whatever, That's a good way to say it. Yeah. Wh whatever that means. <laughs> I'm sure they spent a long time coming up with that. Clearly, they believe that what's developed in the banking system is a substitute for rate hikes. And to your point about the dot plot, I think we can probably agree around the table that if we got the dot plot three weeks ago, that was going from 5.1 to 560. So let's say they believe the developments of the last couple of weeks are worth about 50 basis points. I've got no idea how much conviction they've got behind that view or whether that really is their view, but I think we can read between the lines. Andrew, how on earth do you make an estimate as to how much the tightening of lending standards may develop off the back of the story the last couple of weeks and how that equates with a level in Fed funds? Yeah, I think it's really, really difficult. And, and I, I, I worry a little bit about these statements that the tightening and credit conditions is going to substitute for exactly 25 or exactly 50 basis point of rate hikes. Um, because you're making an assumption first about how policy rates transmit through to financial conditions broadly, and then how financial conditions broadly transmit through to the real economy. And, and think about what's happened here. Um, there's all this talk about substituting for, for rate hikes. Um, well, we were pricing policy rates to go above 5.5%. We had two-year yields above 5%. Now we have two-year yields around 4%, 100 basis points lower. So do we think the tightening of credit conditions substitutes for 100 basis point lower two-year Treasury yield? Because that's what's happened in, in the market. If, if we don't, then essentially what markets are pricing is the Fed to fully offset or more than offset the tightening that we've had in credit conditions. And, and that's really an issue for the Fed if they thought that they had to get policy rates above 5.5%. And financial conditions are now loosening. So we have credit conditions tightening, but we have financial conditions loosening. Um, if you saw the housing data yesterday and over the last month, every indicator is turning up now. 
So we have a bottom in the housing market. It's rising from a bottom. I think that should be another concern where you say, we were trying to slow down this economy. Now the sector that's most responsive to interest rates is starting to reaccelerate. To your point, given where market pricing is now, how vulnerable is the infrastructure of a market that's been whipsawed again and again and has a lot of fragilities baked in through leverage? How vulnerable is this market to a Fed surprise, a massive Fed surprise that disrupts where things are? Yeah, I think that that's that's the other real issue for, for Fed officials now, especially given the new emphasis on financial stability risks. Is, as a central bank, you're always trying to smoothly and incrementally guide policy rates, guide market pricing um, to what you think is the right level to be consistent with mandate consistent inflation. And the issue for the Fed now is we have this huge disconnect between where the dots are and where the market is. Um, like we were just talking about, if anything, Fed officials maybe wanted to go a bit higher than that. If, if we start seeing the inflation data come in strong again, and we think we will over the next few months, all of a sudden we could be back in this world where Fed officials think that policy rates need to be much higher. And then can you get there in an incremental and smooth way, or does this become a more violent adjustment? And, and again, I mean, look, look at the volatility we saw in two-year yields. I mean, in some ways, that's reflecting the fact that we could very quickly reprice what the Fed is going to do. They're in a massive bind right now. I think once you get in the business of acknowledging that you think the developments of the last couple of weeks are a substitute for rate hikes, if they get worse, I just wonder how you can keep saying that we're going to get no rate cuts this year. Because if you believe they're a substitute and we're very close to what you've indicated as terminal, then ultimately you should be pulling back if things get worse, Do just to maintain the calibration of, of where you think policy should be. But this market's not going to see it that way. This market's going to price in a major rate cutting cycle. The moment they say pause or the fact we might have to calibrate things in a different direction. They already have, and that's Andrew's point. Conditions have already eased in tandem with the expected potential implied rate hike of credit stress. That's a big challenge to pause in May. Yeah. Neil Dutter of Remax said the same thing. If you pause in May, how do you stop this market from pricing and even more rate cuts? And then things ease. And Andrew, this was great. 550 to 575. What a call. Andrew Hollenhorst there of City. Equity markets right now positive. Let's call it six tenths of 1%. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. In Russia, a reporter for the Wall Street Journal has been detained on spying allegations. According to the Federal Security Service, Evan Gershkovitz was detained in Yekaterinburg on suspicion of spying for the American government. Gershkovitz is a U.S. citizen. The Wall Street Journal says it's deeply concerned about his safety. There is another sign of Republicans growing uncertainty regarding American support for Ukraine. Congressional Republicans say billions of dollars for Ukraine risks being misspent and could be better used for domestic priorities. House Foreign Affairs Committee Chairman Michael McCall criticized Western European nations for not supplying as much assistance as the U.S. MSCI is about to lower the ESG scores of about 31,000 funds. The firm says that clients had voiced concerns about an upward trend in ratings across the fund universe. The European Commission has told Bloomberg it's planning to unveil new industry rules regarding environmental, social and government scores. Intel says that new chips for the lucrative server market will come sooner than expected. The company will shift to a more advanced production technique and offer a new chip that is faster than analysts had predicted. Intel CEO Pat Gelsinger is trying to reverse market share losses by reclaiming technological leadership in the server field. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. Things have started to calm down. And the fact is, if this is it, which increasingly looks like it is, then we do need to go back to, to, to the think about the Fed of a few weeks ago. We do need to go back to looking at the data. Nothing's broken. We've repriced a bit. Everything's working sort of pretty well. So, you know, can we reprice more from here? Yeah, absolutely. That was Lee Ferridge of State Street. Let's put that together with what we heard from City's Andrew Hollenhorst. And let's throw in, let's say, another week of gains in the equity market. How many weeks of gains do we need in the equity market? How many weekend 
do we need to be free of banking issues before we go back to two, three weeks ago? Or do you believe, Lisa, we're past the point of no return and this has just set the snowball rolling down a hill towards a disinflationary bust? It sounds like a riddle. How many how I'm, many weeks of gains does it take? To, I know. And it's a great question. And this is really ultimately, who knows, at the same time, at a certain point, to the conversation we were just having with Andrew Hollenhorst, how does the Fed push back against pricing when it still is dealing with uncertainty? How does it push back on 100 basis points of rate cuts being priced into the market and essentially easing financial conditions, causing easier lending standards without knowing whether there's tighter lending standards on the other side that's offsetting that? And let's suppose the pre-banking crisis trend in economic data continues. Let's work through it. Claims stay under 200K. Payrolls look robust. CPI looks sticky. More broader, elevated core. All of that bad stuff. How long... Do we have to go month after month after month after month of that for the Federal Reserve to say, OK, maybe we have to start moving, which essentially is Andrew Hollenhorst's argument. City's making the call that the tension in the banking system isn't going to show up into the economic data for at least eight, nine months before you get into 2024. And if that's the case, you could get this drip feed of economic data that's pushing them to, to hike rates. At least we've said this a few times. Three weeks ago, to Lee Ferridge's point, it was 50 basis points and a terminal rate maybe with a six handle. Three weeks later and everything has changed and all of, all of a sudden everyone's got this conviction. We get this disinflationary bust. That's a big change. Traditionally, people thought that the bond market was smart and that the stock market was dumb and that basically bonds knew something that stocks didn't. And right now, bonds are trying to sniff out some weakness and basically say, OK, uh, we understand that the Fed's going to have to cut. It's going to have to cut on weakness. Stocks are saying, look around, sniff the roses. They're fantastic. And we've got like gains. We've got a robust economy. We can go buy things. And at this point, I do wonder how much stocks have it right for now. And bonds may be eventually right, but they got to wait so long that it's going to feel very wrong. Can we go back to the conversation of a month ago? A month ago when we were seeing tech cut after tech cut after tech cut, and we were saying, when is this going to show up in the broader economic data? Roku this morning, 200 employees. If you are just tuning in, welcome to the program. They're going to cut 200 employees. Let's call it 6% of the workforce. The stock's positive in the pre-market. We know we've got this bull market in the Nasdaq 100. We'll build on for you through this morning. But that's good news. That's good news for the stock and good news for investors. Apparently, not my view on the situation, but that's the way this has been taken. There are different kinds of layoffs because there were the Facebook layoffs, the meta layoffs, were rumored to be there were people who were employed but had no jobs, basically to hoard labor ahead of what they expected to be this rapid expansion that never happened. So there's that kind of layoff. And then there's the nuts and bolts layoffs, the difficult ones where you have to look around and say, we just can't afford to keep you. The nature of the layoffs matters. The nature of what company we're talking about has a significance. And with this particular one, again, does it mean that they have the excess to cut? Or does it mean that they see slower growth and slower potential going forward? Those are different kinds of cuts. And I think that it's important to understand, especially as we get more announcements like this, which it is. The stock in the pre-market up by 2.8%. Let's get to the broader story for you. In the equity market, futures right now up a half of 1% on the S&P 500. Yields totally unchanged, 356 on a 10-year. In the FX market, euro dollar 108. 82. Spanish inflation soft. You'll get the German headline data a little bit later this morning. Crude 73.80 on WTI, up a little more than 1%. Year to date now, looking at what's happened with crude year to date, we are down about 8% on WTI and down about 8% on Brent. Let's talk about it now with Christian Malik, the global head of energy strategy at JP Morgan. Christian, great to catch up with you, sir. You've still got this big triple digit call out in the future, but right. you're bearish in the near term. Can you just explain why? Right. It's, uh, it's, it's, it, it's it's sort of one of those things where we've had to sort of put the super cycle on hold for 12 months. And the reason for this is simple. There's far too much inventory, whether it's floating dark barrel or dark inventory, or barrels being stored among refineries. And that's a result of all the buying, sort of panic buying that we saw last year. So we ended up getting a lot of oil hoarded into the market, particularly in the EM world. Um, so that uh, allied with a lot more coal consumption by China, what that's doing is creating an overhang of excess supply into a surplus that we predict into Q2, which con which which combined means that all prices uh, don't necessarily have a flaw. And then we look at OPEC and you look at what they're trying to do with managing the price. We think that they won't defend oil unless there's extreme downside uh, uh, volatility to the downside. And so that combination leaves us um, in more of a sort of 60 to $90 range for this year with downside um, and we're recommending to our investors to buy once we see uh, that downside materialize. 
talk about what gets us there. I'm looking at Brent right now at $78.94. You see potential for $60 uh, over there. What pushes us there if, for example, the potential weakness uh, that we've seen globally hasn't done it? If China's reopening that's been rather disappointing when it comes to uh, global growth doesn't materialize, what gets us there? A couple of key catalysts. First of all, um, we're still sort of walking into this recession. We're traveling, if you like. We haven't arrived. That arrival could be uh, a fairly hard landing, particularly in the U.S., uh, and that is unfolding as we speak. The second is the banking contagion. Um, it's a known unknown, uh, if you like, but still we have um, we have to watch and discover what is next around potential weakening of demand as a result of cr uh, tightening credit. And the third, and really sort of staying the obvious, is that we still have a lot of excess inventory and a surplus that we're going to in Q2. So as inventories build, if you like, those are the catalysts, that could weaken um, the, the crude market, even if if you do see a seasonal pickup in demand. So that combination, allied with some positioning, which I think has been very net longer, that's obviously reduced, could see um, further downside. But I think also that's sort of on one plane, if you like. On the other plane is how the OPEC dynamic evolves right now. Um, there's been sort of radio silence on that front. And what are the relationships with OPEC and how that's going to build over the next three to six months? How they react to volatility will be a, a, a somewhat of a, a reveal to the market in terms of how willing they're how willing they are to support various flaws in the market um, if it's apparent they're not willing to necessarily support um, let's say $70 oil um, that could be another further downside to them to, 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 to crew particularly given the way we see investors placed at the moment is that uh, a put option is fairly well embedded uh, around 75 to 80. Uh, if that put option is not necessarily there, I think that will surprise the downside if you like a catalyst. OPEC plus. Can we talk about the plus a little bit more? Where does Russian supply yeah. fit in here? It's a great question. I mean, I'd like to know that too. I mean, Russian barrels are ultimately um, floating and, and at full volume in the market. They've surprised everyone to the upside. And I think you know, whether they can continue to stay uh, at record levels, and particularly versus pre-COVID or not, I think the key point is, how do they fit in with their quotas in the context of OPEC Plus? I don't think necessarily it's open season. They've got a lot of vested interest to keep OPEC Plus together, but it does make me wonder, particularly given they're trying to discount their crude, and from a technical standpoint, can they actually reduce materially if they were, if they if they were asked to? These are questions which I think puts into uh, puts uh, obviously some tension around whether they can comply on a sort of quarterly basis with the OPEC Plus um, framework, and that in itself could suggest a, a precedent for others not to comply, particularly um, if, there is a, if there is a need to, and OPEC has to come in and take more volume off the market. So Russia in itself um, could be problematic in terms of um, getting compliance across the rest of the group. Christian Malik, thank you, sir. Thanks for being with us. Global Head of Energy Strategy at JP Morgan Securities. Think about that range, 60 to 90, with a touch of downside. Sounds like a recipe, doesn't it? And then you go out to 2024, and we're talking about 150. 150 on crude again. Mind-boggling. At the same time, anything can happen. Oil has been one of the hardest trades. It's been a widowmaker trade. No matter what you do, it, people have been trying to game it out and been getting it wrong consistently. I do find this the question, the one that you asked about Russia oil supplies. We were supposed to see prices go up because of a lack of Russian oil. There was no lack of Russian oil. And that's the rub here. So at what point does that just sort of change the scenario back to where we were pre-Russia's uh, invasion of Ukraine? Or do we get some sort of decrease in Russian supplies based on the economic pain that they're experiencing and the lack of personnel? Because they're seeing a huge brain drain. They're also seeing a huge flight, particularly of younger people. Are we saying sanctions aren't working? Is that that measure right there, the fact that we're at 60, 70 still? Isn't that an example that the sanctions aren't working? Was the goal of the sanctions to prevent Russian oil from getting on market or for, to prevent money for that oil to get into the hands of Russians? You could ask on both sides, is either working? That's a good question. I don't know that we understand the answer. <laughs> I think that's well put. Thank you. We'll leave that there. Thank Sebastian you. Page, T. Rowe <laughs> Price is going to join us next around this table here in New York. Looking forward to that conversation. Equity futures up six tenths of one percent on the S and P. The rally continues. The Nasdaq 100 back in a bull market from New York City. This is Bloomberg. Every day that goes by, we're getting more stability. I think Washington wants it to stop. 
I think barring any other major shocks, I think it's behind us. Nothing's broken. We've repriced a bit. Everything's working sort of pretty well. The underlying strength of the economy and the underlying strength of corporate balance sheets is still with us. We are still in a bear market and it's gone on for quite a long time. Let's be clear. The event over the last few weeks has been an equivalent to tightening. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell and Lisa Abramowitz. The tone of these interviews has changed so much after a one-week rally. It's just what happens. You get the headlines that we're back in a bull market and all of a sudden it's crisis over. From New York City this morning, good morning, good morning. For our audience worldwide, this is Bloomberg Surveillance. Equity futures right now up six-tenths of 1% on the S&P. At least we started the previous hour with this. We've got to do it again. The Nasdaq up more than 20% from a December low. So is this a bull market or is this a bear market rally? And either way, it's basically how you frame it depending on where you think the trajectory is. Some people would say this is the beginning of Let's go, because if the Fed's going to cut rates and keep on going to zero and basically the economy is going to chug along, let's get in there. And that's definitely a feeling among some this morning. And Neil Dutter of Renaissance Macro talked about some of this yesterday. You might enjoy this quote. He said, pick your battles with the consensus wisely. He went on to say this. It reads as follows. There is no middle ground in a banking crisis. It either happens or it doesn't. This means the bond market is either pricing in too many rate cuts or not enough. What do you make of that? It's correct in terms of the 2008 type of bank crises. It's correct when it comes to certain historical reference points. It's not correct if this is a slow-moving bleed of deposits that goes out of the smaller banks and restricts lending. That's not a crisis, but that would lead to some sort of restricted credit that would have an accelerating factor. And I think that's what people are looking for. Let's say we don't get those bank failures. Is that potentially worse, especially if yields remain high and people keep putting their money into money market funds? May 8th. When we get the senior loan officer the most opinion thing. survey, yeah. it's nuts, isn't it? <laughs> it's absolutely crazy. We're going to ignore CPI. We'll ignore payrolls. Are we ignoring bank earnings or can we pay attention to that? We're going to pay attention to all of these things. The headlines are going to do one thing. To Andrew Hollenhorst's point, does the Fed look past the headlines? And is there, are they able to look at the actual data and say, we have not gotten any close to our mandate? We are still so far away from price stability and 2% uh, inflation that we need to keep going. And then can they do that if the market has priced them out already? And they're going to cause some pretty violent swings. More Fed speak coming up a little bit later. Lisa will give you the guide for the day ahead. In the previous hour, just a bit of breaking news from Roku. Another tech firm making cuts, 200 employees to go, about 6% of the workforce. We'll pick up on that in about 30 minutes' time. The broader equity market looks like this on the S&P 500. Firmer positive. We add some more weight to the S&P, north of 4K of six-tenths of 1% on the S&P 500. Yields essentially unchanged, 357 on a 10-year. And Lisa, euro dollar, very close to 109. Stronger euro, weaker dollar, the theme this morning. We had Spanish CPI, downside surprise. I believe we get the headline for Germany a little bit later. People are looking under the hood and seeing that core is still above 7% and saying, OK, let's not get too excited here. How long are they going to keep looking at the core? And the fact that people still are expecting rate hikes from the ECB highlights how different uh, the European region and the U.S. are in terms of how quickly they've moved on. In the U.S., 8.30 a.m., we get U.S. initial jobless claims. We've been talking about this. How many numbers does it get before people start to care about them, before people start to think, OK, we actually are in a strong economy? We have seen the unemployment rate fall to some of the lowest levels since 1969. And we can see that other than 2020, typically it takes a while for the unemployment rate to go up. So how much can people price in this tightening, this end of a cycle, before we've even seen a cycle that could take potentially some time to bear out? Today, we do get a host of Fed speak. What are they going to say that gives us any insight into anything? Richmond Fed President Tom Barkin, Boston Fed President Susan Collins, Minneapolis Fed President Neil Kashkari, if they aggressively push back on rate cuts and say this market is fooling itself, that could be market moving, especially given some of the push-pull that we've heard in markets. You look skeptical. I'm just not sure how they can, based on what? Based on what? What is going to reconcile the difference between where the Fed is and where the market is right now? If it's not economic data, is it bank stocks for the next couple of weeks? We've been talking about this now for days. I'm not sure how they can, with conviction, turn around and say, no rate cuts this year. I think the market is allowed to take a view on the situation, adapt to the incoming information and say, this is where... And I know it's not one individual, it's a collective view on things. I think the market's allowed to have a different opinion to the Federal Reserve. And it does. And so when you ask what can reconcile it, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen speaking at the NAEP conference in D.C., does she come out and give some indication of how the banking crisis truly is over or policy measures that they are going to take 
Could that be something also very significant? Unless, of course, an easing of financial conditions con conflicts with where they think things are going. But once you've turned around and said that you think the banking developments are a substitute for rate hikes, it's fair game, isn't it? That they could be, but we don't know how many. And there's a, not like, you know, I'm not sure difficulty. how much they lent on could <laughs> just last week. Fair, fair point. You know? And certainly people took the signal from that. And now we've got a lot of rate cuts baked in. Sebastian Page joins us now. I'm pleased to say of T. Rowe Price, the global head, a multi-asset and CIO, a reluctant and timid bear. Good morning. You're going to translate that for us. What's a reluctant and timid bear? You know, my three takeaways from the banking crisis are, first, it is a negative for the economy, no doubt. Second, it does mean a more dovish Fed, but probably not as much as the market thinks. And third, it is not a 2008 kind of event. It's not a gigantic systemic bomb. You know, the bottom line is that every time the Fed slams the brakes, someone's head goes through the windshield. And here we had a few banks that weren't wearing their seat belt. But it is not systemic a la 2008 in my mind. So your cash position has been big for a while. I've looked at your notes and you've um, got a subtle nod here to Tom's triple leverage cash fund. What are you doing with that cash and what ultimately are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? The bearish narrative is very strong, Jonathan, right? If you just think about the plethora of indicators that are flashing red, you talk a lot about the yield curve being inverted. It's still inverted. It went all the way down to 100 basis points inverted. LEIs, leading indicators, are flashing red. PMIs have dropped by 16 points. We expect the housing market to go down in residential 7 10% this year. Someone just sent me a scary chart this morning. Default rates in private commercial real estate, very much on an uptrend year to date, way higher than during COVID. That's a risk that bears watching. And what is the market doing? 17, 18 price earnings ratio in the S&P 500. That's more expensive than stocks wear were before the sell-off of 2022, if you adjust for the level of rates. Earnings expectations are still for positive earnings growth this year. And on and on and on. The bearish narrative, you know, is all about the liquidity impulse being negative globally. So why am I a timid bear? Because all these numbers are all from very elevated levels from very high levels of liquidity, from very high house prices, from extremely high PMIs. So it's a question of we all obsess with the rate of change and the rate of change is not that good. And we are underweight stocks and we have this cash here and it could get worse before it gets better, especially with the impact of the liquidity impulse. But at the same time, you have to pay attention to the levels, which we don't talk as much. And so, you know, think of PMIs where they are now. They could, they, they could bottom somewhere and, the, you know, somewhere lower. And the question is, when, when do we reach the bottom here? I love that you call this a black duck, not a black swan, because of the levels and because of all the liquidity still in the system. Is this Fed, is this ECB really determined to withdraw liquidity from a system at a time when their balance sheet, I'm talking about the Fed's balance sheet, is climbing to some of the record highs? I mean, it's really pretty close still. And you're still seeing rate cuts being priced in to counter weakness that is still extrapolated out from something that hasn't happened yet? It is such an important question, Lisa. I think it is the question. Can central banks have a foot on the gas and a foot on the brake at the same time? And by that, I mean what you saw with the UK LDI situation, where the Bank of England started buying long duration gilts as they were hiking. The ECB is doing something similar by backstopping Italian bonds while they're pretty resolute about hiking. So what is the Fed saying? Well, you know, you heard Powell say, look, this banking stress is restrictive. The Bloomberg Financial Conditions Index, you know, is moved by a standard deviation, actually moved by two standard deviation, now is stabilizing at one standard deviation tighter. So it is restrictive. But I think with inflation where it is and as sticky as it is, by the way, five year, five year, like longer term expectations for inflation, they're up right now. Uh, and so I think the Fed can continue to have the narrative of hiking, maybe another hike of 25 basis points, stay there uh, while if something breaks, if someone's head goes through the windshield again, who's not wearing a seatbelt? Who knows? 
while implementing emergency liquidity measures. Foot on the brake, foot on the gas, it's counterintuitive, but this is where global central bank policies are going right now. How much do you see declines in equities before you start to get interested? You know, I think you could see another drop of 5, 10, 15 percent. It really depends on the circumstances of why we get that decline. But as Tom would say, he's not here today, but you want to see the VIX back up. You want to see capitulation in the VIX. And that's that's usually a good signal. And by the way, on the liquidity impulse, this is not talked about enough, I think. We're about to bottom. The liquidity impulse is negative. Liquidity is being withdrawn from the system. And we have yet to feel all the lagged effect of those 500 basis points. But given the dollar coming down, given China opening up credit, some level of growth that's reasonable in China, the liquidity impulse towards the second half of the year, and at some point we'll unwind QT as well, is going to turn positive. We're not always, you know, we're not trying to catch the bottom per se. And we've done research that shows that if you're just willing to lean in when things get bad, you don't have to time the bottom. You can be a month early, you can be a month late. 12 months later, which is a horizon, you'll do just fine. So we're just waiting for that. Patience, and by the patience. way, we're, we're, in, we're invested. You know, it's not, we're underweighting stocks. We have some cash. We added a bit of duration. We added a bit of treasuries just because of the turbulence. That's where we are. Hey, Seb, this was great. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Sebastian Page of T. Rowe Price. Lisa mentioned a few times this morning that we'll hear from the Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen a little bit later this morning in some prepared remarks, according to the Wall Street Journal. This is their lead paragraph right now, Lisa. The Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen plans to say that regulators might need to tighten banking rules after the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank, arguing that the recent turmoil is a sign that efforts to bolster the financial system are incomplete. Now, this was always going to be a bit of a split here, right? On the one hand, people will say we need more regulation. There'll be another group of politicians in Washington who will say this was about enforcement. How is this going to read through to a market that's looking for the all clear signal if she's saying that there still is potentially some problems that are systemically embedded in the oversight function and in the regulatory function of these banks? We'll catch up with AMH, Anne-Marie, not down in D.C. She's up in New York. That conversation coming up next. And later, Peter Chair of Academy Securities. We'll catch up with him in the next hour. Sebastian, thank you, sir. This was great. A reluctant and timid bear from New York. Like this me. is Bloomberg. <laughs> not quite, Lisa. <laughs> Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. In Russia, a reporter for the Wall Street Journal has been detained on spying allegations. According to the Federal Security Service, Evan Gershkovich was detained at Yeratekenberg on suspicion of spying for the American government. Gershkovich is a U.S. citizen. The Wall Street Journal says it's deeply concerned about his safety. In Kentucky, two U.S. Army helicopters collided Thursday night during a training exercise near Fort Campbell. The military says there were several casualties, but it's not saying whether those were injuries or deaths. The HH-60 Blackhawk helicopters were from the 101st Airborne Division. The FDIC is thinking about having big banks cover a larger than usual portion of the $23 billion hit from the recent banking failures. Bloomberg has learned that the special assessment on the industry will happen in May to shore up a $128 billion deposit insurance fund. The regulator is under political pressure to spare small banks. The president of Taiwan made a stopover in New York and called the island's future a test for the world. Tsai Ing-wen's trip may further escalate tensions between the U.S. and China. Beijing says the visit will have a severe impact on the relationship with Washington. The latest census numbers show that Manhattan's population grew while New York City's other four boroughs lost residents. In the 12 months through July 1st, Manhattan added more than 17,000 residents. It's still about 98,000 residents below its level just after the start of the pandemic. Global News powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo and this is Bloomberg. Are you aware that NLRB judges have ruled that Starbucks violated federal labor law over 100 times during the past 18 months, far more than any other corporation in America? Sir, Starbucks Coffee Company unequivocally, and let me set the tone for this very early on, has not broken the law. What an exchange yesterday between Senator Bernie Sanders and the former Starbucks CEO Howard Schultz, the founder of the company, which employs 402 thousand people. Lisa, what did you make of that yesterday? 
There seems to be this desire to kind of take a populist tone with big companies, and yet big companies are employing large swaths of the entire American population. So there's this real dissonance here at a time where you want to have this anger, and yet nobody can figure out where to put it. Now, the clash, the tension around Starbucks to one side over unionization, and they're going to work through that. It's an important issue. Can you imagine if we did have the same degree of union membership now as we did back in the 70s, and what kind of pass through we might have seen? from headline inflation through to wages and how much this really could have spiralled. Should we not consider the counterfactual here? This has been one of the beliefs that people had was a risk, especially as labor started to get a lot more power after the pandemic. Not that it's a bad thing to get wage increases, but it would be harder to end up stymieing inflation if you get that kind of increase. So, yeah, there is a sort of push-pull. Again, where do you put your anger at a nuanced moment when you have, you know, facts that are dis uh, that are uncomfortable in terms of what you're looking for in the, uh, with respect to the outcome? I can tell you there was a fair bit of anger and tension between the two of them, and if you want to check it out, Check it out on YouTube. Fantastic exchange. Equity futures right now on the S&P 500, up six-tenths of a 1% on the S&P. And the bond market yields unchanged. 3.55 on a 10-year. In the FX market, euro dollar not doing much. Up a third of 1%, 108.77. A little bit later today, you'll hear from the Treasury Secretary, Janet Yellen. And according to the Wall Street Journal, she's set to say the following. The Treasury Secretary plans to say that regulators might need to tighten banking rules after the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank and, of course, of Signature Bank. She's going to go on to say she will argue that the recent turmoil is a sign that efforts to bolster the financial system are incomplete. I'm pleased to say that Anne-Marie is up here in New York City, our chief Washington correspondent. Morning, Anne-Marie. Good morning, guys. Thanks for having me. AMH, incomplete. What's yeah. left to do? Well, she's probably pointing to what's happened in terms of the rollback of these Dodd-Frank measures for some of these smaller mid-sized cap banks in 2018. Uh, she also says these events remind us of the urgent need to complete unfinished business. So she's really tipping her finger to the likes of Senator Elizabeth Warren and all of these Democrats who are coming out and saying we have to look at the easing of these regulations that happened in 2018 under the Trump administration because of these failed banks. But we know that there's other issues at play here. And Michael Barr was very direct about it yesterday. He said, almost taking a little bit of blame on the supervisor's role. Yes, we saw all these things un unraveling over the course of the year, but we didn't step in quick enough. Under the Trump administration, with bipartisan support. 17 senators, 33 lawmakers in the House. You're 100% right. And some of those senators are still there today, and they are not pointing to the lack of regulation and this rollback in 2018 as part of the reason for this. Let's talk about the consequence of having to pay for a $23 billion hole in the FDIC's budget. Is there any pushback whatsoever in Washington to basically having a special levy on the big banks? Well, listen, they do not want this, especially the Biden administration does not want anything that could lead to a campaign slogan that it was a taxpayer bailout of banks. And what you're potentially going to see is a lot of pushback from lawmakers or officials as the FDIC tries to figure out how they're going to maybe put this levy on banks, yes, but that bigger banks maybe should have to pay a higher percentage, not the smaller banks, because they're the ones that potentially could get hurt the worst in this. This kind of hurts my head. I got to be honest. <laughs> and this is the reason why I keep saying with respect to the anger that trying to figure out where to place your anger, it's frustrating to understand. So people don't want small banks to fail because they want the credit impulse. They don't want to crack down on them because it'll increase the cost of funding. They don't want them to fail, but they don't want to bail them out. They want big banks to bail them out repeatedly. Big banks don't want the responsibility or the cost. So they say that we're handling this responsibly. What's the way out of this? Basically, just the push-pull, and this continues forever? Yes, push-pull. Um, I mean, it's a great question. It's This is the landscape we're in right now, right? And what you actually see is people are, and this is what lawmakers talk to us about in Washington, that their constituents are so concerned if they bank with a smaller bank that and those banks are telling their their representatives, we have to do something about this because we are losing deposits because people want to go bank with the JPMs and the Bank of Americas because they're worried that this is another SVB signature bank. This frustrates a lot of people. And you, have I think, have already drawn the distinction this morning, Anne-Marie, between regulation and enforcement of existing regulation. Yeah. When banks fail, the leadership, quite rightly, goes. And you often see politicians make a big deal of that. We made sure that they weren't compensated. They've lost their jobs. OK, I don't think you'll see much pushback to that. Mm -hmm. When regulators fail, tumbleweed, why does nothing happen? 
Well, that is a great question. When regulators fail, there's all these hearings and they talk about all the steps they went through and they talk about these investigations. But we should remember the Fed has investigated itself now at least two or three times. This is the first time we're actually seeing them be welcomed to a outside probe. Um, but it is a great question. And I, this is the moment that did it for me this week. It was Senator Tester, a Democrat, and he said, it looks like the supervision and regulation was there, but no one brought down the hammer. So this is really a question of should Congress be the ones that have enforcement on regulators' jobs? I mean, there is a bill that is circulating now between Senator Elizabeth Warren and Rick Scott, two names you rarely see together, about the co the investigator at the Fed. Why should that be appointed by the Fed governor's board? It should be appointed, they say, by the president, and the Senate should be able to give confirmation to that individual, because in the end of the day, they're the ones that are looking into this. Well, you mentioned Senator Warren. She's really pushed this. Senator Warren has questioned Chairman Powell's ability to she regulate himself. called him a dangerous himself. man. Well, that was in, in the hearings for a, second, for a second term. She's raised it a couple of times in the last few months, whether the Fed should be investigating itself. It doesn't really make sense, does it? No. When you really think about it. No, this was the trading scandal, remember? They brought this in-house and they investigated it. They investigate themselves. This was the Kansas City, that tech firm. They investigated themselves. And now this is the collapse of SVB. I think there is another question brewing on Washington, whether or not this is the Fed in Washington or this is the supervisory in San Francisco. How much is this playing into this feeling that government has gotten so dysfunctional that they can't really get anything done and they all just chase their tails examining things? Well, that definitely feels a lot like Congress, doesn't it? Um, I mean, it, is it more so than usual? It Maybe it feels like that because we're in it at this moment, but I'm not sure if it's – it's always like this in divided government, <laughs> so right? Hearings are always like this. Politicians will tell you the point of a hearing is to slide into the chair, make your questions <laughs> and your remarks, get the YouTube click, and then they leave. Would it be Many of these people don't even sit for the full hearing. Would it be better if they weren't televised? Would it be different? No, I'm a TV broadcast journalist. I want everything <laughs> clearly, televised. Clearly. Remember yeah, this, this remember the, this remember the alone, C-SPAN? Would, would it correct? Their objective is clearly to make a YouTube video to send to their constituents. If you get rid of the cameras, does it make the hearings better? I don't think you're ever going to hear me say get rid of the cameras. Remember the 15-vote speakership and C-SPAN came in and we saw the tension on the floor? That was actually really cool. Yeah, you. we got to see some incredibly interesting dynamics. And that is because... We had more, a, a closer look into what was going on. I keep thinking about what Wendy Schiller of Brown University said yesterday when she was talking about how when people stop banking at a local bank, they feel less connected to the financial system and less connected to the political system, and it creates real fissures that have lasting effect. I thought that was fascinating, and I understand how that could be the case. I bank in Canada. And the UK, so. <laughs> you bank in Canada? <laughs> yeah, I'm TD. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> Anne-Marie, good to see you. <laughs> AMH, up here in New York for tomorrow as well? Yes. Looking forward to that. That's great to, great to have you. Thank you. AMH, Lisa, do you bank in Canada? Well, no, I do not bank in Canada. I bank at a local, very large bank. But I do, you know, <laughs> okay. there, there is this question, though. Do you feel you know, connected to the financial system? <laughs> for other reasons, Banking I suppose. Banking with Bank of America? Well, whatever. <laughs> I'm not going to confirm nor deny any bank of any sort. I mean, but it's a fair point, you know. People are like, you know, their community bank, local place. Get yeah. a toaster. Okay. Kathy Jones is coming up, Chief Fixed Income Strategist at Charles Schwab. <laughs> Looking forward to that conversation. Equity futures right now on the SP up by five or six tenths of 1%. Rally continues on the S&P 500 on the Nasdaq 2, live from New York. Good morning to you all. Equity futures on the S&P up six-tenths of 1%. A few hours away from the opening bout of the Nasdaq 100, we add some more weight to that bull market of five six-tenths of 1%. People get so frustrated with the use of the term bull market. 20% uh -huh. move plus 
after lows of December. Does that bother you? I, I don't really care enough to get really wound care. up about it. I just think it's kind of funny that somebody will call it a bull market if they're positive, and somebody will sure. call it a bear market rally if they want to just basically cast some uh, cold water on it. Twenty percent so. is one heck of a bear market squeeze, right? Well, and then people will say, "But look what happened before." It just basically is a calendar date, and blah blah blah. It really highlights the incredible volatility and the lack of certainty amid an environment where we really don't have a lot of facts. Uh, not at all. Not at all. We're going to have to wait for those facts as well. The month of March in the bond market. March is still not over. It's still not over. Q1's still not over. It feels like we've had about two decades in the first uh -huh. three months of 2023. In the bond market on a two-year, 4.06%. We were 102 basis points north of that about three weeks ago. And then I think we got to about 355 intraday a couple of weeks after that. And that's basically where the 10-year is right now. So the 10-year is where the two-year was a couple of weeks ago, so 355. Here's, here's my question. If it whipsaws back, is it just fine? Because we've seen these really violent moves and nothing nothing is broken except for a couple of banks here and there. If they like, they get things kind of together, then can we move it back if the Fed decides that they want to go ahead with rate hikes and not cut rates? So we mentioned the spread between the Fed and the market, and you said something along the lines, does the Fed speak make a difference today? And I, I question that. The Fed speak alone is not sufficient. What's going to re resolve this gap will be the incoming information. And, and what I want to understand is whether that's the traditional economic indicators or, as you've pointed out repeatedly over the last couple of days, the senior loan officer's opinion survey, which comes out on May 8th. Now, that's not much information to go on. And once you get it in May, then how long do you have to wait? Another three months? Great question. And then you get some monthly indicators here, there and everywhere. To resolve that gap traditionally, I'd say, well, the data will take care of that. Wait for CPI wait for payrolls and then everyone will get on board with more rate hikes. But this time around, I'm not so sure of that. I think we've become much more desensitized after the developments of the last couple of weeks to traditional traditional economic indicators. If someone can sense frustration, it's because we're trying to make sense of something that is a swirling morass of just complete uncertainty. So I'm sure we're not alone. I sense that frustration from a lot of people. One thing that's less frustrating is to understand perhaps the individual stories of specific companies. We talked about Roku saying that it was going to cut about 6% of its staff uh, or about 200 workers. Those shares higher by almost 3%. Its goal is to lower costs. We've heard this many times. It's also planning to get rid of certain facilities. This follows what we, ha what we heard yesterday. Uh, uh, EA, Electronic Arts, also announced some layoffs, uh, about 6% of its workforce. So this is just more on the trend. Restoration Hardware, those shares are lower by about 5.3%. Basically, weaker than expected full-year guidance, disappointed with the outlook. How much is this going to be connected to weakness in a housing market that's not being reflected at all in the housing uh, builders, which have been on a tear, as you pointed out earlier, John? I mean, it's, it's amazing what's happened with the home builders yet today. If you take a look, though, at mortgage rates they've crept back down pretty significantly. It's the lowest levels in about six weeks. What's the argument for the banks, though? Work through it with me. The argument for the banks, or the argument against the banks, is that they need to tighten lending standards, and no matter what happens with this banking crisis, this is a massive earnings headwind because they're not going to make the same loans. OK. So what does that mean for the home builders? Why would you have such a massive spread between bank stocks, which are aggressively lower on the year, and the home builders on the S&P 500, which are up something like 13 percent or so. Why are you looking for cohesive, logical arguments? I mean, honestly, come on, we've seen this market. But, you know, some people would say home builders are thrown out last year, so now you can go in and buy. But it's a good point. I don't know that logic really will get you very far with a lot of the market moves that we've gotten recently. Charles Schwab uh, shares declining about uh, 2 percent. Am I wrong? Carry on, please. <laughs> Charles Schwab <laughs> shares are lower by 1.3 percent, as much as 2 percent earlier this morning. Uh, Morgan Stanley came out and said that Schwab's clients are pulling cash out of the firm's low interest accounts at twice the rate that those bank analysts initially thought. I mean, this has been some of the fear that we have heard really percolate, and we've heard a lot of executives come out and push back against that. But this, to me, is the bigger question. Let's say bank is, banking crisis averted, no more collapses, we can move on from the hearings and get on with our lives. How much do you see the ongoing drip, drip, drip of deposits leaving banks that leads to that constriction that people are expecting? Well, let's talk about traditional banks. Something has to happen with deposit rates, right? Now, does that have to happen at the larger banks? Do they just attract the capital because they're seen as safer? Or do we actually see, I mean, you saw the stats, the money going into money market funds. We got that from last week. Do they have to do something about this? Have you seen much movement on that front by any of these banks? Have you seen any, got any emails saying, We'll offer you 4% if you park your money here. I haven't seen much of that. I've gotten some personal emails being like, you know, don't malign us. We actually are offering yields. But I think that, to your point, it's not being advertised. The question for me is, when does all of the money flood into money market accounts, or does 
the fear of potentially losing your deposits lead people to just accept basically negative I'd like returns. to talk to a treasurer at a company, the people that's got to manage the money, you know, what they're doing with their banking and how that's changed over the last couple of weeks. Because we're it's talking hundreds of millions of dollars. Say for Roku, who had that parked at SVB, they came out with some job cuts this morning how they've changed the way they bank and where they park that money. And you are so correct saying it's the companies and those CFOs of small businesses that we really need to talk to, not individuals, not mom and pop. Those deposit accounts aren't necessarily well, going to break the bank in the same kind of way. They're also insured. They're insured. Everything's insured. Can you provide enough insurance for corporate America or do they have to manage the money differently? It's a great question. I hear, hear, hear some people at home screaming right now, Bitcoin, which is what Tesla did, right, for a little while. <laughs> and then that didn't really go anywhere. People will scream Bitcoin at everything. I mean, and they might have been right. Kathy Jones of Charles Schwab won't scream Bitcoin. She says this. The recent developments in the financial sector reinforces our view that the Fed is likely to tighten until there is an economic downturn. Inflation will continue to ebb, pulling yields lower. Kathy, great to catch up with you. Kathy joins us now. Good to see you, Kathy, as always. Kathy, then, what do you think is the relationship between what's taken place in the last couple of weeks and what these guys are going to do with the Fed? Yeah, I think what the Fed has proven by hiking rates the last time instead of just pausing for a moment in the midst of a banking crisis is that they're really ready to um, continue to push short rates higher uh, until the household and uh, business pain is felt, i.e. probably recession. And as they keep doing that, even in the midst of huge volatility in the market and huge you know headwinds to the economy in terms of tightening credit conditions it tells us that that's going to push long-term rates lower um that we've had some re-steepening of the yield curve that's probably not accurate uh in the sense that the fed doesn't look like they're going to give up easily and so probably means you know we'll get further rate hikes and uh and further downward pressure on growth and inflation and lower bond yields down the road kathy hard to be precise about this but can we go through some ranges together so at the, the moment the two years at four percent the 10 years at 355 what kind of numbers are you thinking about yeah, I'm thinking that the two-year looks really rich to us right here. Uh, obviously, the two-year's been everywhere in the last three weeks. Um, but I think the two-year looks a little rich. So, you know, we're probably looking at another 25 uh, to 50 basis points on the upside, perhaps, there. That's going to pull up long-term yield, 10-year yield somewhat. But I don't think you'll see much north of 375, 380 on the 10 year. And then as we go into the, the second half of the year, um, we'll probably see all of that drift down. But I think the, the short end is just not priced for a Fed that's going to remain aggressive. What do you make of the whipsaw action that we've seen in the two year? How do you understand it with the logic that this is supposedly the most liquid and broadest uh, bond market in the world? Yeah, I mean, the realized volatility has been just off the charts. And typically, you don't see that in the Treasury market, especially in the short end of the Treasury market. But I don't know that it's a structural problem. I think that it's actually more reflection of the rate of change in uh, yields that we've seen from the Fed. I mean, I'll go back and say, if we look back a year, nobody thought they were going to start raising rates at this uh, at this pace. The Fed didn't think they were going to be raising rates at this pace. And that we'd see other central banks do the same. And so when you've got that rate of change in the underlying policy rate, you're going to get a lot of volatility in, in, in yields. And I think that the market is trying to game where the Fed is going uh, based on a lot of different indicators. And, uh, you know, you get this high realized vol. So I'm not sure it's an underlying liquidity problem so much as it's a, a rate of change problem because we're still executing a pretty, pretty reasonable spreads in the market. When we talk about the uncertainty, what's your North Star in terms of data to have conviction amid all of this swirling? Well, we're watching financial conditions really closely. Um, now, there's a number of, we, we like the Bloomberg index, but there's a number of other indicators that we're watching. I think that that's the bottom line. And when I look at the data, what I see is this, this heightened um, volatility is going to tighten credit conditions and it's going to tighten financial conditions. So that's what we're keeping an eye on. But a lot of underlying indicators beneath the surface, like credit spreads and the lending facilities, uh, all of those are going to be really important to keep an eye on. 
Cathy, do we need to get away from traditional financial conditions indicators and focus on things like the senior loan officer opinion survey in a bigger way? Yeah, we, you know, I've, I've always paid attention to it. I think it's really important, and uh, particularly the small to medium-sized banks. And that was flagged. Uh, the tightening of credit conditions was flagged, you know, months before this happened. So um, I think that is important, and I do think we'll probably see a whole bunch of analysts now doing on-the-ground research in terms of interviewing businesses about their, their loan conditions. Also, have to look at the private sector, uh, where a lot of lending has taken place, and small, more leveraged businesses. I think there'll be a lot of focus there. So, yeah, I think that the traditional, you know, spreads-based um, indicators may not give us enough information. Hey, Kathy, thanks for that, as always. Kathy Jones there of Charles Schwab. Lisa, important distinction to make, and I know to some extent, of course, they're related, but we've been focused overwhelmingly on the price of money, how the Fed sets it. This is now a story about the supply of credit. And there's a difference there. It's an important one. Especially if you have banks that don't have the capital to lend and are much more discretionary about who they decide to lend to. It's an important distinction. And people point to that uh, auto loan survey where 9% of all applications for auto loans were rejected up from 4% or something in just a couple of months. So do you start to get this kind of restraint on banks that are capital restrained themselves? And then they get a profit hit. Right. And this is sort of the way that it plays out into the economy. I just wonder if the yield is there, there is going to be someone who's going to want to lend. And you talk about all, even if it's the shadow banking system and how much money they have to pony up and to potentially lend out if the yields get good enough. A few more days of this and it'll be crisis over. <laughs> it's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, well, crisis over, but maybe then people need to look at other things. It's not as quickly moving. The tone shifts so much. I know a lot of you have said it. It's not new, but it's always the market, you know, that Pricing sets. determines the narrative. Big time, you know? Absolutely. The market shapes sentiment. Sentiment doesn't shape the market. It's always the way. Futures up on the S&P by half of 1%. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. The Wall Street Journal says it's deeply concerned for the safety of one of its reporters who's been detained in Russia on spying allegations. According to the security service SSB, FSB, the American, American Evan Gershkowitz was detained in the city of Yekaterinburg and is suspected of espionage in the interests of the U.S. government. He was said to be collecting information about the Russian military industrial complex. There is another sign of Republicans growing uncertainty regarding American support for Ukraine. Congressional Republicans say billions of dollars for Ukraine risks being misspent and could be better used for domestic priorities. House Foreign Affairs Committee Chairman Michael McCall criticized Western European nations for not supplying as much assistance as the U.S. China's premier calls the country an anchor for world peace and said it will be a force for prosperity. Li Zhang spoke at a business forum in China he also said the economic recovery is picking up pace. Lee expects that March will likely produce a better outcome than the first two months of the year. In Mexico, the government is blaming federal agents and private security for the deaths of 39 migrants caught in a fire. Authorities say none of them opened a door to allow the migrants to escape at a detention center in the city of Juarez. The fire was started by some of the migrants. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. Let's be clear, the event over the last few weeks has been an equivalent to tightening. It'll be different in different jurisdictions, uh, but this certainly you know, has slowed the overall process of rate hikes. If anything, I think the Fed and global central banks, they will keep rates higher for longer. Not super high, uh, as uh, we've feared in the past, um, but they will be higher for longer. That was the brilliant Jeff Yu, BNY Mellon Senior Market Strategist, live from New York City. Equity futures higher by six-tenths of 1% on the S&P 500. Good morning to you. Your 10-year yield 
almost unchanged, down about a basis point today, 355 on a 10-year. We had some inflation data out of the Eurozone a little bit earlier. Spanish CPI softer, much, much softer than expected, actually. Big downside surprise. And Lisa, when do we get German inflation? 15 minutes? Something like that. Top of the hour? That'll probably be... Um Notable, I will say. The reason why perhaps people are shrugging this off is because the headline reading came in at 3.1 percent. That was down from 6 percent in February. And if you look, though, under the hood, you can see that core inflation kind of stayed the same area, 7.5 percent. So people are focusing on that core and really dismissing some of the energy price fluctuations. Plus, throwing in all the guidance we've had from the ECB. They're not throwing the towel in anytime soon. Well, at least that's the verbiage. I mean, again, the data really will speak much louder. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. So, I mean, this data, though, people are really just looking at the core. German CPI up in about 13 minutes' time. We'll break that down for you. Joining us now is Jason Goldberg, Managing Director and Senior Equity Analyst at Barclays. Jason, great to catch up with you, sir. I see you've put out some work on commercial real estate. There are, let's say, a lot of fears out there about what might develop in that part of the economy. How are you framing things for clients at the moment, Jason? Yeah, no, Ajay and his team put out their global macro um, quarterly piece today and a host of stuff on the banking industry um, that we focused on. You know, with, certainly with respect to commercial real estate, I think it's important to note you kind of enter this period of uncertainty from really, really benign levels. So if you kind of look, delinquencies in the third quarter were an all-time low, and while they upticked in the fourth quarter and expected to continue to increase um, in the year ahead, um, it, it's, it's coming from low levels and, you know, real estate losses for the industry have kind of been sub five basis points for the last couple of years. Um, but if you think about recent events, um, particularly kind of what's happening in the post Silicon Valley world and, you know, the potential for regional banks to kind of pull back on lending, at the same time, a lot of commercial real estate needs to be refinanced. Um, and it's an area that we think investors are going to increasingly focus on. So how are you focusing on it when it comes to specific regional banks that you see as having a disproportionate exposure to commercial real estate loans? Yeah, no, that's a good point. I mean, if you, if you look at the you know the in industry overall, you know the biggest banks, you know, commercial real estate tends not to be you know the main driver of the loan portfolios. But as you kind of go down in size, particularly below the top 20, 25 banks, um, it, it does become a more meaningful a meaningful driver. And I think within that portfolio, it's certainly important to distinguish you know between the different property types. I think at the moment, you know, really the most concern around the office sector, just given the fact that you've had. Um, you know, this big kind of secular shift in terms of kind of work from home, um, kind of post COVID. And at the same time, you're seeing, you know, property values decline as a result. You're seeing higher interest rates making it more difficult to service the debt. And you have a lot of loans kind of maturing um, over the next couple of years. So, you know, so those banks with outsized exposure have to be particularly uncosmetic in terms of how they manage this risk. People have talked about potential 30 percent downside in uh, commercial real estate prices, particularly tied to the office space. At what point do we see that realized? Why have we not seen more losses realized yet, given that a lot of people have been talking about this? Yeah, so, you know, just because the value of a property declines, you know, doesn't necessarily mean you, you take a loss. If you think about it, you know, we all buy homes and, and the prices don't always go up. Um, I think respect to the banks, keep in mind, right, they're kind of the average loan to value ratio um, on a typical office loan is probably 55, 60 percent. Um, so they do built in some cushion. Now, around those averages, obviously, you know, there's certainly going to be some loans um, that have much higher LTVs. Um, and as we look out, it's certainly something to watch. Keep in mind on these office loans, um, you know, typically office buildings have seven to 10 year leases. Um, you know, so this problem will kind of take some time to materialize and hopefully give time uh, to banks to kind of work with their borrowers, you know, maybe readjust some terms, extend uh, duration and, you know, manage this in a more thoughtful manner. Jason, that's the right word to explore, time. How are you thinking about the timeline for this to play out? Because some people think this shows up in lending standards, and I'm talking directly about the developments of the last couple of weeks in the in the banking sector. We had City's Andrew Hollenhorst, Jason, come on the programme a little bit earlier this morning, and he said you might not see this show up until 2024 just in terms of the economic data. Jason, what kind of timeline are you thinking about with the team? Yeah, no, it, it's going to take some time to play out. If you think about it, you know, loan losses are at historic lows. Um, and, you know, we do kind of expect them to kind of gradually grind higher. You know, banks have been adding to loan loss reserves, um, so that will help a a as well. Um, and, you know, keep in mind, there's a lot of other pockets of commercial real estate that are doing, you know, quite well. And, and the majority of bigger banks are kind of diversified. So it's not like you have, you know, everything going bad at once. So, we, you know, we do think, 
you know, at the end of the day, loan portfolios are somewhat a reflection of the economy. The economy, I think, has outperformed a lot of people's expectations, um, and that will be certainly something to pay a lot of attention to. Jason, as you and the team get together and look at indicators for how this is developing, Lisa and I have spent the last week saying that maybe because of developments of the last couple of weeks, that traditional economic indicators have kind of been de-emphasized de in some way. What are you and the team looking at right now? What do you focus on at the moment? Yeah, you know, certainly you're kind of looking for more, you know, real-time data. You know, certainly the Fed's H8 report, which comes out every Friday afternoon, kind of showing loans and deposits on a 10-day lag for the banking industry has heightened interest, um, just given the fact that deposit flows are of the utmost importance post the actions of uh, SIVB a few weeks ago. You know, obviously loan growth um, as well. You know, you're talking earlier about tightening lending standards. Um, you know, the first three days after SIVB, you did see loans increase. You know, that's something we'll certainly be paying a closer attention to in the coming weeks to see, you know, what ripple effects um, recent events are having on the banking industry overall. What about the mitigating factors? When I take a step back and I think about the existential question behind some of these big city office buildings that are very difficult to, difficult to convert into residential because of the lack of windows in a sort of strategically placed manner, what is this going to look like in 10 years? Yeah, you know that that's a, you know certainly uh, certainly a good question. Um, you know, and we'll see. You know, there's certainly some secular trends at force in terms of you know not people not many not as many people going to the office, um, and perhaps you know some of that is cyclical. You are starting to see you know it feels like more and more people um, you know returning to the office. So we'll see how that plays out. You know, there's certainly been talk in in certain cities where turning some offices into you know more residential properties in areas where there's a kind of housing shortages. Um, so that's something to pay attention to. Um, but, you know, clearly there's, there's likely a need for, you know, less real estate in certain sectors. Even if we don't get any other bank collapses, Jason, this pressure alone, the commercial real estate overhang and the overexposure by some of the banks in the regional sector, how much do you think that's been accurately priced in to the valuations of these equities? Yeah, no, that, that's a good point. I mean, if, if you look, you know, the worst performing bank stocks, um, you know, post the Silicon Valley debacle have been those with the highest uninsured deposit um, contributions and very large held to maturity losses um, in the, or unrealized losses in their securities portfolios. Um, so that was kind of the initial names to trade lower. Um, if you look kind of after that rung, the next kind of worst performing bucket are those banks that are overexposed to commercial real estate, you know, with, with many of those stocks down, you know, 30, 40 percent um, year to date. And I think just given the fact you know, that the concerns that, you know, the tightening of credit post Silicon Valley will weigh particularly on a commercial real estate kind of exacerbated those fears. Um, so certainly, you know, I think the market has kind of been quick to kind of realize the potential issue here. Um, and I think to your point earlier, though, it will take, you know, a fair amount of time uh, to play out. And, I, you know, we're all kind of eagerly waiting earnings results in mid-April and quite frankly expect, you know, loan losses to really not be um, something people focus on this quarter, just given credit conditions still feel pretty benign at the moment. Interesting. Jason, this was wonderful. Let's catch up again in a month if we can. Jason Goldberg there of Barclays. April 13th, First Republic. I think April 14th, JP Morgan. And maybe the story won't be in those numbers. That's what he was just saying. And to me, then how do you believe the story that you see on the ground that isn't reflected in what the reports are actually telling you? And that has been one of the main conundrums baked into the market. We keep returning to the calendar. May 3rd. Federal Reserve, have they got the information they need? Which is the reason why some people think that before what happened with the banking crisis, that the Fed was going to make a mistake, that it was going to be a policy error, that they were going to over-tighten before we saw the effects, the lag effects come into the market. Now they're really in a difficult spot because if you get a solved banking crisis and we keep seeing robust data, what are you waiting for? And then you pause. Well, if you pause, this market thinks you're done and prices in more cuts. That's their problem right now. Peter Cheer of Macro Strategy at Academy Securities is going to be joining us very shortly in the next hour. Futures right now on the S&P, up six-tenths of one percent. Your Nasdaq back in a bull market. Sort of. Things have started to calm down. And the fact is, if this is it, then we do need to go back to the think about the Fed of a few weeks ago. More than anything, they've been lucky. 
in the sense that this particular banking crisis hasn't spiraled. I think the Fed and global central banks, they will keep rates higher for longer. I think it's hard for the Fed to go back to zero. We prepared for the recession. It's just not here yet. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Q1 still isn't over. Need this March. Got like a day left, two days. It's just unbelievable. From New York City this morning, good morning, good morning. For our audience worldwide, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Live on TV and radio. Alongside Elisa Abramowitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. TK back with us tomorrow. He's on assignment. Your equity market right now on the S&P positive. Six-tenths of 1% on the S&P 500. In about 30 minutes from now, you'll get some jobless claims in America. Lisa's going to break that down for you. Just moments ago, we had German inflation data. That followed Spanish inflation a little bit earlier this morning. Downside surprise in Spain. Inflation came in much softer than anticipated. German inflation, well, it's lower than it was in the previous month, but Lisa, it comes in a little bit stronger than expected at about 7.8%. Yeah, and what you're seeing right now is the German preliminary uh, March CPI rose 7.8% versus the estimate of 7.5%. If you take a look at March consumer prices, they actually rose 7.4% versus the estimate of 7.3%. This isn't going to make people feel good. You don't want to get hot economic data, especially with respect to inflation at a time when ECB officials keep saying that that's what they're looking for, that's what they're expecting, and that's what they're going to respond to. And they're going to keep on hiking. Yeah. They don't see the parallels between them and the Federal Reserve right now. They don't see the banking tension that develops into a disinflationary bust in Europe like the Fed might see in the United States. So here's a question. Is the inflation different over in Europe than in the U.S.? Or is it just that they're further behind the U.S. when it comes to the tightening cycle? And do we even understand the level of inflation, right? We don't understand. If the Fed thought that they had to get to 5.5%, 5.75% three weeks ago, have things changed so much that they now think that they can cut rates back down to three by the end of next year? I mean, these are like the levels of uncertainty that are just kind of percolating out there. So yes and yes okay. to those two points, but throw in this as well. The nature of the financial shock in America is so different to what Europe is experiencing, at least for now. I've got no idea what happens in the future, but based on what we're seeing develop at the moment, we've got this regional bank issue that should develop into a tighter lending standards, maybe even a credit crunch. Once again, I've got no idea, but that's where the base case is leaning. In Europe, what have we got? Credit Suisse. And what they've said over at the ECB is they haven't seen the same deposit flight. They just haven't seen the same issues. So you've got a disinflationary financial shock in America that the Europeans don't quite see in the same way locally on the ground in the Eurozone. Isabel Schnabel yesterday was talking about how they're just not seeing the deposits out of European banks in the same way as in the U.S. That said, we haven't seen the tightening in lending conditions to a massive degree yet. I mean, there was a little bit on the margins, but that was by design. So at what point is this not by design and is this undue tightening going to have a material effect on the U.S. at a time when... Remember, Europe had negative yields not so long ago. Uh, yeah. We're now talking about Twelve months three. Ago. I mean, this is it's just very hard for us to wrap our heads around the pace of the increase and the potential tightening to come in the euro region. So to draw distinctions at a time when we don't understand how this is really getting borne out by the economy is difficult. So for the US, this is not the clean way of doing things. This is the dirty way of tightening financial conditions. But ultimately, I don't think you can sit here and say the two issues are in conflict, focus on financial stability, focus on monetary policy and bringing inflation down, when you've acknowledged that the financial stability issues are a substitute to some extent of what you're trying to achieve on the monetary policy side anyway. Have we killed the concept of, of trans, uh, transitory? I mean, honestly, transitory inflation, are there still believers in that? And is this basically this hope that eventually that will be made whole and that then that will just take away the whole question? Because this doesn't seem like there's a very easy answer and the Fed doesn't have any easy pathway through this other than hiking into a significant downturn and hiking until something breaks, including potentially a couple of banks, unless there is some sort of natural disinflation from year over year measures that takes hold. I don't think this is consensus, but there's always someone out there, and I think there are many still, who just believe time would have solved this. Time would have solved it, and time still can Correct. solve this. It's not my view, but ultimately they're out there, and I know they are, because I get a lot of messages from them. <laughs> they're out it's there. It's a mistake. Catching up with one of them a little bit later in the next hour on Bloomberg TV. So when I read out my tease, you can guess <laughs> which one it is. In the equity market then, on the S&P 500, up five or six tenths of 1% on the S&P. In the bond market, yields unchanged. Let's call it 356 on a 10-year, 356.39, 58 now. There's a change. Unchanged on a 10-year. <laughs> in the FX market, there's no point trying to keep up with that. In the FX market, euro dollar just south of 109 at 108.88.
on a euro. Stronger euro, weaker dollar this morning. Euro stronger by about four tenths of one percent. With us now, I'm pleased to say, is Peter Shipp, the head of macro strategy at Academy Securities. Pete, let's talk about this equity market, the Nasdaq. Rip it from a December low at more than 20%. Whaley of BlackRock said earlier on this week that this market believes we're going back to the old playbook. Rate cuts, get along the NASDAQ. She says we're not going back to the old playbook. Pete, what do you say? I would agree with that. I think the NASDAQ rally is a bit overdone. People are expecting the same sort of performance we saw post-COVID. And I think the conditions are just very different. It's not a supporter for that. As a whole, though, I think we want to range trade this equity market, right? As things start getting good, the Fed comes more into play, and as things deteriorate, the Fed comes into play the other direction. So, Pete, that range at the moment, at least since November, has been 3,800 to 4,200 on the S&P. Is that the range that sticks? Yeah, I think so. I'm certainly now fading this rally in the S&P. I'm fading it more through the NASDAQ just because I think the outperformance there has been greater, and I don't like the narrative that we return to 2022. The one thing that remains outstanding for me on the banks, and I think this is one thing that's different than the U.S. versus Europe, is people here have alternatives to earning more than 0.2% or whatever a bank deposit is paying because we've had this gap in rates, and I think people are just becoming aware of that. So that's what I'm watching to see if we see ongoing deposits leaving the banking system, nothing to do with credit concerns and everything to do with what is a better yield alternative. And that's not the case in Europe yet because they just started their hiking cycle. Do you think that this concept of the natural disinflation, the immaculate disinflation, hasn't gone away and is almost embedded right now in what we're seeing, which is that the Fed has an excuse not to hike rates further and to cut rates and that everything will be just fine and inflation will naturally go away? You know, I've been in the camp that we are generally headed towards defla deflation, especially in the goods camp. And we had four or five solid months, right, from September of last year till January of this year, where you saw nothing but deflation. We saw the data bounce a little bit. Right now, you look at inventories. They're creeping higher again. You start looking at shipments and freight. They're going lower. So I think on the good side of things, we're still in an overall deflationary environment. So I think that pulls down. I think housing's pulling down. Healthcare's something to watch. But yes, I think we have overreacted. We have to give this more time. And as these companies are pulling back on their jobs, I th think that just filters through what we've lost sight of, I think, is that there is this long and lag effect, and we're not giving it time. The problem is, as market participants, we don't have that time. We're moving so quickly now, you have to be right ahead of the time. At what point does the 4% implied Fed funds rate by January of next year ease things enough to reinflate some of those prices that have started to come down? You know, right now, that's why the one thing I'm betting on is that either they can't hike as much as people are pricing in, but I also do not think that we see massive cuts by the Fed. I think they're going to try and balance this. I think they're going to be very reluctant. I think we had a huge unwind of positions, especially in the two years. So some of those data, you know, that data and how we're looking at what's going out further out the curve is just mispriced. So I would not bet against the Fed cutting a lot. Well, Pete, as you know, Spreads this large aren't resolved by a speech. They're resolved by incoming information. So can we keep returning back to something Lisa and I have been talking about over the last couple of weeks? What is the incoming information that will resolve that spread? Is it CPI, payrolls? Is it lending standards? What is it? And I think it's going to be payrolls in particular. That's the one area that we had seen wage inflation tick up. It was coming back down. Jobs have been probably the single strongest thing when... It, for the last six months, at any given time, there are two or three things that you point to that were weak. And one thing that was constantly strong was jobs. So watch out what's happening in jobs. A lot of people are still scratching their head. How can we get these layoffs? And they're not showing up in the jobs number. So that'd be the one area I think if jobs continue, the Fed's going to have to hike. If they come back maybe to a little bit of reality, reflect some of the anecdotal evidence, maybe that's what lets the Fed pause. Do you think the market in the meantime for the next month or so, Pete, is desensitized somewhat to that data point? because the focus overwhelmingly is on bank stocks and what's happening in that sector. You know, I think hopefully we can move away a little bit from bank stocks. I think that's calming. It's all about do they keep deposits given this yield differential? And now it's time to start thinking about, okay, where is the economy and what reads do we get um, as we start earnings? And again, it's not going to be about this quarter's earnings. It's going to be what the future outlook is. And I think that's very questionable. Hey, Pete, this was great. As always, Peter Cheer there of Academy Securities. Peter, thank you. Pete thinks it's payrolls, Lisa. There you go. April 7th.
Well, we see actually the decline in payrolls that people are expecting, sort of deceleration in job growth that people have been calling for for weeks. I don't know. And what happens? What's a bigger surprise to markets? If we get an upside surprise, dramatic upside surprise in job creation or massive downside surprise? What's the surprise they'll respond to more? Correct. I wonder just how much we'll ignore decent data, just the belief that there is out there at the moment that it will get worse off the back of the developments of the last couple of weeks you know and what, what it will take to shake that belief because that's pretty entrenched at the moment. There are a lot of people who have consistently believed that the Fed was overdoing it and they believe this is a chance to remedy their errors and I think that they're leaning into that and hoping that they, they'll have to basically carry along. Claims in 20 minutes. If it's sub 200k, what do people say? Nobody cares. Right? I mean, that's basically what's going to happen. They're going to say this is the way it is every week. I mean, this is just normal and it's not normal. This is actually really low. And then it's on to CPI. Then it's on to payrolls. PCE. We, we keep ignoring that too. I mean, it, you, you raise a good point, right? And, and this is sort of the conundrum right now for market participants. It's like, how do you disregard the now? Because it's a rapidly moving scenario and you know that those effects are going to come into play. But we don't know, and this is something we talked a lot about that everyone seems to have forgotten about. We don't know where the neutral rate should be in an economy that was flooded with money and that still is moving at a pretty robust pace. And neither does the Fed. Correct. And particularly now, especially now, given that they're now saying that a tightening in lending standards is a substitute for, for rates, that, that gets you in a bind pretty quickly. They have a very difficult decision. We're going to be hearing from them trying to make some sense of this, and hopefully we can, you know... Have, have you done March Madness? Have you played that? Do you, do you make a bracket? Well, I missed it this year oh, you because didn't get it in. we had a different kind of March Madness. We were, we were sharing, you know... Yes, some, we were doing some, March some Madness in the market. <laughs> yes, exactly. Too, too much quality so, exactly. time. My producer, Jamie, would do my bracket for me traditionally, and it was terrible. So <laughs> this year we haven't even done one. Steve Pagliuca did one of Bain Capital and the co-owner of the Boston Celtics. And I can tell you, he's done pretty well. So we're going to talk about that next, and obviously a whole lot more than that. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. In Russia, a reporter for the Wall Street Journal has been detained on spying allegations. According to the Federal Security Service, Evan Gershkowitz has was detained in Yekaterinburg on suspicion of spying for the American government. Gershkowitz is a U.S. citizen. The Wall Street Journal says it's deeply concerned about his safety. In Kentucky, two U.S. Army helicopters collided Thursday night during a training exercise near Fort Campbell. The military says there were several casualties, but it's not saying whether those injuries or whether they were injuries or deaths. Now, the HH-60 Blackhawk helicopters were from the 101st Airborne Division. The president of Taiwan made a stopover in New York and called the island's future a test for the world. Tsai Ing-wen's trip may further escalate tensions between the U.S. and China. Beijing says the visit will have a severe impact on the relationship with Washington. The FDIC is thinking about having big banks cover a larger than usual portion of the $23 billion hit from the recent bank failures. Bloomberg has learned that the special assessment on the industry will happen in May to shore up a $128 billion deposit insurance fund. The regulator is under political pressure to spare small banks. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. There's this implicit guarantee that banks can be too big to fail. We just saw it with Credit Suisse. There was really no worry that counterparties of Credit Suisse weren't going to be made whole. And if that is the, is the sense of the land, it's going to drive business away from these mid-sized banks and I think is going to have a detrimental effect on the economy. That was Tom Show, the KBW CEO, live from New York City this morning. Good morning to you all. Your equity market shaping up as follows. About an hour and 14 minutes away from the opening bell. Futures up by six-tenths of 1% on the S&P. Higher this morning on the Nasdaq as well after entering, re-entering a bull market, if you want to call it a bull market. If you don't, it's just up more than 20% from the December low, because no. I know some people out there get frustrated about these things. You could just say it's things. a bear market rally. 
of 20%. If you're Lisa, yeah. <laughs> 355 on a 10 year yield in a bad basis point in the FX market, Euro dollar just south of 109. 108, 88, positive four tenths of 1%, and more broadly, right the way through G10 through much of this morning, the dollar a whole lot weaker. I'm pleased to say that joining us around the table here in New York is Steve Paliuka, senior advisor at Bain Capital, founder and CEO of Pax Group Capital Partners and co owner of the Boston Celtics. And Steve, it doesn't end there, but we haven't got a time. Yeah, that's enough. All right, it's good to see you. <laughs> like the brackets for a cause. You can just we, call me Steve, it's fine. Can we start there, Steve? Brackets for a cause. It's a great tradition here at Bloomberg as well to put this together. March Madness happens every year. I can't follow it, but it's college basketball and everyone gets very excited. And you've done pretty well this year. Yeah, I'm excited. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a great group and, and uh, this has probably been the maddest March ever. So uh, where, upset, are you, where are you every now? How many, how many teams have you got left? Because the last time I tried to do this, I think I was out after the first couple of days. It was like bracket done. I can't even fill in all the boxes. I mean, it's Who really have you sad. got left? I think I've got one team left. One team left. UConn. And if you come top three, what's your charity? Um, my charity is the Reform Alliance. Okay, what do they do, Steve? Uh, they're an organization set up by uh, Bob Kraft and Michael Rubin to uh, basically help, help prisoners get, out, get jobs when they get out of prison. Uh, we have a huge prison reform situation in this country. We've got to we've got to really help people get out of that cycle, and, and that's an organization nationally that's been set up to do there. And, and uh, I have a double bonus this year in, in that my, my son actually uh, left his job, and he works for the Reform Alliance. You know, trying, oh, to, wow. trying to help them. So they should get some money off the back of this. I hope so. Based I on hope so. You're go, we have, you, have, you have to go home tonight and say, "Go UConn, go UConn, go UConn." If UConn wins. Reform Alliance gets the money. So go UConn, one. Yeah. Go Celtics, go another one. And go for, Atalanta. For, Forza, at the, Forza Atalanta. Forza Atalanta. Where does this end? Are you done now? You've got enough sports teams? You, know, you never know. I'm, I'm really enjoying the ones that we have right now, and uh, they're winning. And, and uh, I'm actually going to go to Milwaukee tonight and see, see the big game. Celtics playing Milwaukee, the number one versus number two in the East. So that'd be a lot of fun. You have a life that a lot of people would envy. I'm wondering, there has been a lot of interest in getting into the professional sports game for quite a while. We talked about that during some of the heydays of low interest rates. Have you found that change as it becomes more difficult to access capital for a number of individuals, perhaps not yourself? Well, it really has changed. Uh, you know, I think when, when we uh, did the Celtics purchase, it was something like $360 million, and the average NBA club is worth you know, 3 to $4 billion now. Um, so it's been it's been a huge increase, but actually the markets have responded. There are firms that invest in in, uh, in sports franchises specifically, and uh, and people put together consortiums to get liquidity. But do you feel like there is less interest that people now are sort of focused more on the nuts and bolts of existence <laughs> rather than uh, you know just the, the sport of it because there is perhaps other opportunity, but also because they are constrained. No, I, I think it's, it's remained the same. It's it's a highly competitive, uh, fun environment um, in in Boston. Uh, you know, number one sports town in, in the country. Uh, it's just a, it's just a pleasure, and and sports has kind of transcended um, society. And 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 the teams are really doing a lot of good in the community. NBA cares, for example, uh, Boston Celtics, uh, United for Social Justice. They're fantastic organizations that go out and help the community. So it's, it's really become intertwined. Can we discuss exits? You're clearly a fan. How do you think about a potential exit when you have a stake in a sporting organization and you see the appreciation in the overall league? I'm thinking about the Glazers at Man United. I'm thinking about John Henry over at, over at Liverpool. They're clearly looking at these levels and thinking that maybe now is the time to exit. How do you think about that? Well, we, our philosophy is to, the family office is just a long-term hold. It's a great asset for a long-term hold. Um, so, you know, I, I would hope to go to the grave uh, owning, owning these assets myself. Um, hopefully, hopefully, quite a while from now. But, but uh, <laughs> uh, uh, really, long-term hold. I think they're long-term hold opportunities. And uh, uh, now the, the appreciation has been so much. People have got in early that want to get cash. There's a there's a, a, a big market out there of individuals who want to get involved in sports teams, and so they'll be successful doing that. We're seeing very high valuations right now um, because of the interest in it, and because of the growing television revenues and the whole television landscape changing now. As uh, as we, we go from bundling to unbundling, back to bundling again, um, and, and 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 sports programming is the one solid thing in there. People still will tune in and watch that live, so it's become very valuable to all these digital properties, and and the networks. And news as well, Steve. Not just sport. Just throwing that out there. It's sports and news, news and sports. I'm, of I'm course, sorry. And I, should have, I should have put news first. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Thanks for that. <laughs> now that's sport. That's sporting organisations across basketball, football. Take your pick. Let's talk about the broader economy right now. If you've got money to put to work at the moment, how easy is it 
to transact? There's still plenty of opportunity out there. Um, there's a growing biotech sector in the United States, in Boston, San Francisco. Um, there's still technology companies that are, that are doing well. You know, this, this period reminds me of coming off of the, 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 the kind of tech crash in 99. We had a very overvalued situation in tech. Uh, and, then, and then I remember in those days, I would fly out to California and someone would give me a term sheet and say, you have two days to decide. You know, this company's worth 100, 100 million. It has no sales, but it's a great idea to put on the internet. And I was, I was incredulous. I mean, I literally had 17 or 18 of these meetings, and, and I, I, was, I was disoriented. And, and we actually, I think, I think the only year Bain Capital didn't make a major investment was 1999, thank goodness. And then that all crashed down in April. Um, but do you feel like we've gotten the washout that eventually you got in 1999, heading into 2000? Or do you feel like this still is a tenuous moment where valuations haven't found their floor in any way? I would say it's still tenuous, um, and people are going back to the basics, back to fundamentals, looking at cash flow, looking at, uh, at can the company be profitable. You can't have a thousand-year time frame anymore when interest rates are or have gone from you know next to zero to five and a half percent for for a T bill. Um, and you know most of my career, I think three quarters of my career, T bills were at, at four to five percent the vast majority of the time. So we really got trapped in this easy money period for the last ten or twelve years. And now the reckoning has come. One thing that you're so wonderful about is you've got an incredible view into so many smaller companies and how they're accessing credit. We've been talking a lot about the potential for a restriction in credit really weakening the profile of these companies. Have you seen any evidence of that accelerating, especially over the past couple of months? It's, it's definitely an issue that, that we, we've invested in, in about 40 or 50 uh, venture companies in my family office. and. Many of them need more capital because the banks are, 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 with the Silicon Valley situation, they're reining in and making sure these companies have more capital to pay back those loans. Um, so the market's reacting. There is capital out there. But I think that's something to watch for sure. Steve, we've talked about what to watch, the traditional economic indicators, CPI, payrolls, and whether it's lending standards over the next couple of months. What do you watch? every single day. How do, you, how do you gauge things at the moment? Well, I, I actually uh, travel around so much, I try to get out there in the real economy and see what's happening and, and talk, to, talk to lots and lots of people. And, uh, you know, we, we've had this, this kind of savings build up through COVID, which is, a, which is a good thing. And when you go in New York, restaurants are crowded. Uh, every, every flight I'm on is crowded. So I haven't seen, uh, personally, I haven't seen a huge economic slowdown. There's still, there's still money out there. There's lots of jobs. There's, job, there's job offerings. Many of these tech cuts are because the tech companies overspend or with cheap money just went into areas they should have never gone into. So I don't believe those are fundamental, you know, cutting to the core of the tech companies. That's just a restructuring to get back to the basics and get back to where they're really adding value and making money rather than um, trying to send uh, a man to the moon. The year of efficiency at Meta. Yeah, you know? yeah, 70 percent gain of efficiency. And, st and still plenty of guys trying to send people to the moon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. There still are a lot of uh, yes. We 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 talk about that. Every hey, time Steve, it happens. this was great. Thank Soon you. you guys will be in, to be doing interviews in the moon in ten years. I'm looking forward M to that. Maybe I look forward to going up there with you. Yeah, I was about to say. Perhaps. Yeah. What you kind of first, team? You first, Bramo. What kind of we'll team? We'll send TK have? first. <laughs> have a little Tom can go team. up for us all. No doubt. Steve Palliacra, Bank Capital. Thanks Steve, so thank you, sir. It's good, good to see to you here. as always. Your equity market right now on the S&P positive a half of one percent. In the next hour on Bloomberg TV, Dominic Constam of Mizuho, Evan Brown of UBS, Jack Caffrey of J P Morgan, and Amanda. Lynham of BlackRock from New York. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Welcome back. Just moments away from getting some data in terms of jobless claims. Will it matter will be the key fo uh, focus point. We still are seeing a lift in markets ahead of that. We have seen that 20 percent rally since the December lows in the Nasdaq. Call it what you will. It continues today. You can see the S&P also up about a half of a percent, really trying to get some signal from bonds, meandering a kind of feel there as we wait for some indication of how the data is evolving. The latest data we have a sense from Michael McKee who is down in Washington, C.C., Bloomberg Economics and Policy Correspondent. We're getting some numbers right now. And, Lisa, we're not getting any surprising numbers. A little bit of a rise in jobless claims, but still below 200,000. 
198,000 for the last week uh, ending in March 25th. So it does appear that uh, the labor market remains stable. A few more job uh, applicants or job losers may be applying for benefits, but it's not a significant change, not the kind of change people have been expecting. The four-week moving average goes up to 1,689,000, and we have uh, GDP out. 2.6%. Uh, that is a tick down from the last uh, quarter, uh, the, and the second response, put it that way, to uh, the GDP numbers. Consumer spending drops off to 1% from 1.4%. And that's, uh, that's kind of the big deal here because people are talking about maybe consumer spending is falling off. I think I have lost you on your end, Lisa, so I'll just turn it back to you and you can ask Vince uh, how he th sees things going. Thank you so much, Michael McKee. Right Right now we're seeing in markets uh, kind of gyrating around. If you take a look at the two-year, uh, definitely seeing uh, very little reaction just in general. Things moving along, as we have stated in the past, trying to get your head around where we are in this sort of tipping point of a moment because it feels very much like a muddle. Vincent Reinhardt had some wise words about what it is when you're in a muddle. Perhaps people are just waiting for some downside surprise to trade more aggressively. Chief Economist at Dreyfus and Mellon joining us now. Vincent, can you explain why this muddle is interesting to you? Uh, because we're at a turning point in lots of different ways. Federal Reserve had been on a one-year mission to slow aggregate demand. Maybe it's happening. We got the sharp turn associated with the uh, financial strains in in particularly at small banks, is that going to show up anywhere? In some sense, the most interesting thing about the report that Mike just, just gave was the date at the top, March 25th. It's our first reading on, on activity, a really noisy one, uh, that said, uh, that comes after the banking strains, and we haven't seen anything yet. We're just waiting for that. So, Vincent, this is the problem that people have. When they look at the actual data, it looks strong. It looks like a robust market. It looks like inflation still is running too hot. Not a lot of signs of cracks in the real economy. What gives you confidence? What gives others confidence that you just need to wait and it will come? Okay, so the late, great Rudy Dornbush had a phrase, which is, everything takes longer than you expect, and then when it happens, it's really fast. Uh, that's the sort of thing that happens with the business cycle. Uh, turning points are distinct. Uh, the unemployment rate goes up a lot after having gone down just a, a tenth or two or moving sideways after a long time. What gives me confidence that some bad things would happen to the economy? Uh, we've had a significant Federal Reserve tightening. We have tightening in uh, uh, the banking system, particularly on the ground, uh, small banks seeing deposit runoffs, that's bad for credit availability. We have our trading partners slowing. Uh, there is, you know, the, the simplest uh, reason to expect some slowing is trees don't grow to the, the sky. Output is above what we think is the efficient potential. The unemployment rate is suggests labor markets are very taut. Macro economies don't last that long in that state. Uh, something happens, and it's to the downside. And that's the reason why people are focused on the prognostications of people at the NAEB conference in Washington, D.C. Michael McKee back with us. And before uh, we really get further with Vincent, Mike, I'd love your perspective of what you're hearing from the participants in the National Association of Business uh, Economics at a time of such turmoil. Well, one of the predominant themes here is that the data we're getting from the government is uh, partial because the response rates have dropped a lot, and, of course, it's backward-looking. So there's been something of a focus on uh, consumer produ or uh, business-produced data, rather, that uh, is a little bit more timely and maybe has a little bit more uh, validity and uh, some of those numbers are not looking good in terms of consumer spending. Uh, Visa people were here yesterday, and they see declining momentum in consumer credit card use and the 60% uh, possibility of a recession by the end of the year. So there is uh, more of a foreboding mood down here, even though the data don't seem to have turned yet. Well, could you weigh in on that, Vincent, this idea that perhaps the surveys aren't accurate, that the response rates have not been robust enough to really give an accurate read on what's going on. 
So, Lisa, the answer to the question, are there problems with government statistics, is always yes. And it's in every dimension you can think of. And COVID is uh, the, the pandemic and the shutdowns related to it. That was a real-time stress test of everything, including how we collect data. And it's not surprising that response rates are, are, are lower in the same way that coffee places are, you know, uh, on the corner of shut down. Uh, we're not going in the office nearly as much. Uh, and the patterns of business activity have shift, shifted. Very tough for the government to catch up to, with it. Got a lot of sympathy with, for what Mike said. Well, look to where people are shifting. If we're moving online, then rely more on private data sources that are more on top of that. Uh, the problem is we don't have much of a time series i.e. it's not a long history. It's not like you can, as Chair Powell said in a press conference a bit back, it's not like we can run 10 pandemics through the model and say, aha, this is what we predict. That's the problem with our data, too. So, Vincent, based on uh, the sort of parameter of risks, which is really great, and the tail risks that are getting wider and wider for the Federal Reserve, do you think that it's appropriate for them to err on the side of over-tightening or under-tightening right now? So I think that most times when the world uh, uh, gets more uncertain, like now, uh, you would say still take your best shot and aim for the middle of the wider range. And I think that's what they're doing. Uh, I don't know. I wouldn't characterize it as under or over tightening. I think it's appropriate now they move gradually and be willing to stop if some of that incremental evidence suggests the economy's turning. And that's what they seem to be willing to do. That was the whole idea of dropping ongoing further increases. That was the whole idea of uh, Chair Powell being so tentative about the outlook. I think they got a firm. Uh, however, I, I hope uh, they've got the wisdom to stop if the evidence suggests that we should. Mike, a lot of people point to this question around the banking stress and a particular withdrawal of credit as accelerating and being equivalent as several rate hikes. How much are people basically supporting that view at the NAEB conference? Well, it's interesting. They had a discussion of that yesterday uh, involving Rich Clarida, the former vice chair of the Fed. And the problem for the Fed is they just don't know. The models or past history would predict that you would see a credit tightening. And there are all kinds of estimates from three-tenths of a percent to uh, one and a half percent in terms of uh, the impact on the economy. But uh, the Fed is at this point flying blind on this. We'll get a senior loan officer's opinion survey uh, probably in May. They'll have the data before their meeting. We probably won't see it, but that'll tell us something about whether credit t standards have tightened. But they had already tightened. So do we think they are going to tighten a lot more in response to what's happened? Or were these kind of idiosyncratic situations and the banks that are lending are still going to be lending to their good customers? Uh, it's, it's a tough situation for the Fed because there is a, a sort of a historical feeling this might happen, but there's no data that tell us what is happening at this point. Vincent, when you take a step back and we write the history books on this period of time, how will we look back on the tipping point of Fred, Fed credibility, not only with respect, respect to policy, but also with respect to supervision of the banking system? So I think if, you, if you're asking the question, let's, let's take the satellite view and look down, uh, the big issue is going to be lower for long. And it's going to be a theme running through the macro economy and the banking sector. Keeping rates low for too long, let inflation move up and set up an enormous macroeconomic problem. Keeping rates too uh, uh, low for too long made banks complacent, worsened a mismatch that's natural on bank balance sheets and led to some of the stresses uh, we've seen now. Supervision is a layer on top. Uh, and uh, could we supervise, regulate and supervise banks better? Yes. Could we write better banking laws? Um, almost certainly. But those are weak points in a system that get stress test by a macro imbalance. And the macro imbalance was lower for longer. So I'd focus on the, on the big picture. 
we do, said. Do you think, what is the rate that we could go down to that is the new low that wouldn't be considered potentially perilous on the levels that you talked about? Uh, so I... <laughs> So I, I, I think that uh, I, I'm not going to say a level. I think it's uh, it's a level relative to some t neutral rate, and I think it's about changes. This is this is a time for old-fashioned monetary policy making. An official tells you, "Well, I'll we'll have to go back and check the model. We got a problem because, as Mike was saying, the the models." aren't reliable right now. We don't have long time series of the new data. We don't have shocks like we just had. It's it's about talking to people and be willing to change the stance of policy based on your gut feeling about what's happening to the macro economy. Uh, recognizing you have to fix a problem that you had you created lower, uh, associated with lower for longer. Vincent Reinhardt, wonderful as always. Thank you so much for being with us of Dreyfus and Mellon. Also, Michael McKee in D.C., thank you so much as we parse through the data and parse through the commentary. The gut feeling that people have down in Washington, D.C. is that things are not all right the way that we can see. And the weekly jobless claims coming in at 198,000, still sub 200,000, a tick higher than last week, but still incredibly low from historical perspectives. Coming up, Christian Neuer of BNP Paribas and Banque de France. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. The Wall Street Journal says its family denies allegations that one of its reporters was spying in Russia. According to the security service, FSB, American Evan Gershkowitz was detained in the city of Yekaterinburg and is suspected of espionage. He was said to be collecting information about the Russian military industrial complex. Vladimir Putin's spokesman says the reporter was, quote, caught red-handed. There is another sign of Republicans growing uncertainty regarding American support for Ukraine. Congressional Republicans say billions of dollars for Ukraine risks being misspent and could be better used for domestic priorities. House Foreign Affairs Committee Chairman Michael McCall criticized Western European nations for not supplying as much assistance as the U.S. The U.K. is set to outline its strategy to speed up the deployment of renewable power and capture carbon. It's being billed as a response to the green subsidies in President Biden's Inflation Reduction Act. But the measures in a draft document seen by Bloomberg News show little in the way of new spending. The price of Bitcoin went over 29000 briefly today, the highest it's been since last June. And that's when a series of industry bankruptcies began, scan, scandals began to weigh on investor sentiment. Now, an overall increase in risk appetite in global markets has helped boost crypto prices. Bitcoin's up more than 70 percent this year after falling 64 percent in 2022. And the latest census numbers show that Manhattan's popular growth, while New York City's other four boroughs lost residents. In the 12 months through July, Manhattan added more than 17,000 residents. It's still about 98,000 residents below its level just after the start of the pandemic. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. At the moment, there is a lot of uncertainty about what the financial turbulence uh, means for us in the euro area. Overall, I would say at this point, it looks that, uh, that uh, we have um, a somewhat smaller problem uh, than we are seeing uh, in the US. So at least so far, uh, it looks that um, uh, as if our uh, banks were uh, actually quite uh, resilient. ECB executive board member Isabel Schnabel yesterday in Washington, D.C., talking about the relatively hawkish tone that we've heard from the ECB as we get inflation reads that do come in hotter than expected, albeit uh, somewhat decelerating. In Spain, it actually came in much below this morning. But if you take a look at the core, it definitely came in hot. Uh, and it, with German inflation, yes, it has gone down. We got the reading uh, just about 45 minutes ago. But still, uh, coming in stronger than expected with uh, 
consumer prices rising 7.8 percent year over year in March versus the seven and a half percent median estimate. This is a joy, and I'm very excited to have our next guest with us to really understand both the connection between the U.S. and Europe, not through London as much anymore, but also how you navigate all of this as a former central banker. Christian Noyer, board of directors member at BNP Paribas, an honorary governor at Banque de France, joins us here in New York. Uh, what brings you to New York? Well, um, I'm meeting a number of financial institutions uh, because in the wake of Brexit, we have considerably developed uh, the financial uh, center of Paris. It's been very successful, in particular uh, because we want to grow uh, considerably the capital market in Europe. Uh, we thought, and apparently rightly so, that Paris was the, the, the best place uh, for developing uh, market activities. And it's working. We have all the major American and international banks on top of the French banks, which are uh, the, the, the most important uh, for market activities in Europe. And uh, we, have, uh, we have more than 600 uh, um, asset management uh, institutions now in Paris. Uh, we start to have hedge funds. We have uh, all the major um, insurance uh, institutions, including Chubb, uh, and etc. And so it, it's very innovative. It grows. And so I wanted to talk to a number of American counterparts to uh, 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 encourage them to continue growing Paris. It's a fascinating time for you to be talking with the heads of different firms, especially given some of the concerns around the banking industry in the United States right now and also globally. What have you gleaned from people in conversations? How worried are there about some sort of acceleration in the recent uh, fissures? A very good question. Thank you. Um, I think they fully understand that the uh, the business model that we have, in particular in France, I mean, the, we have uh, mostly five uh, major banks, which are universal um, uh, universal banks, uh, exactly like the big American banks. Uh, so they are they, their business model is very resilient. They are fully subject to uh, to the international so-called Basel rules, uh, with uh, very uh, um, important uh, um, uh, requirements in terms of solvency and liquidity. They are very strong uh, and they resist well. It's very different from, uh, I mean, what happened with uh, mid-size uh, or small American banks, uh, which had different business model, very concentrated, and not fully compliant with the international rules. Uh, so we, we believe that there is absolutely no. Uh, uh, no risk in the, in the European area. Perhaps no risk of contagion or some sort of bigger banking yes. crisis. But people have talked about, perhaps more on the U.S. side than on the European side, that because you can earn something on cash now, that does lead to a flow of capital out of banks. Have you been experiencing that in any significant way? We have not at all been experiencing that. I think the, the basis of deficits uh, for our banks uh, is very diversified and uh, there is no i mean the, the, the only risk you have if if an institution is is considered as weak that there would be a flow towards uh, other kinds of, of deficits. Otherwise, if it moves to uh, market instruments, uh, if the banks have uh, a large access to capital markets, uh, uh, they, they can refinance easily. All the more easily that uh, because the central banks had injected so much liquidity, they had excess deposits. So if some of those deposits move into uh, short-term bills or uh, instruments, uh, it doesn't change the, the soundness of the liquidity. In the meantime, a lot of people started this year incredibly enthusiastic about European banks, saying that it was going to be a golden era at a time when they already had been so beaten up in terms of valuations, but also finally rates were something, right? Finally, there was some kind of interest rate proposal that could really increase profitability. Is that story still intact? Absolutely. I mean, when interest rates move up, um, you have to be very cautious uh, during the, 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 the time they increase, of course, because uh, it, if your balance sheet is not uh, well hedged, uh, you might have uh, some problems. I do not see any of those problems because the hedging was done well. Uh, the risk management was done well. The, uh, the ratios of liquidity were were much above the, the legal requirements, which had been considerably strengthened after the crisis of 2008. And 
bit by bit and over time, of course, as you say, uh, an increase in interest rates is uh, is yielding more revenues uh, for those banks, and so it's it's good for them, absolutely. So you were the first vice president of the ECB yes. when the euro was launched. It has been a long period of time, a lot of it with negative or zero rates. <laughs> what would you do if you sat on the ECB right now? What would you like to see them do? I think, uh, well, I don't know, no great advice to give them, but uh, um, no, I think what they're doing is right. That is to take seriously uh, the need to come back to, um, to, to price stability, to the, to the target that, uh, that was defined. A little bit like what the Fed is doing here, by the way, uh, because I th I do think, and we thought that at the beginning of the ECB, and I still uh, believe that in the medium to long term, having price stability at a, a level around 2%, which is the official target for the ECB and the, as for the Fed and all major central banks, by the way, uh, of the developed world, uh, is the, the the, the condition to um, to have maximum economic growth and man maximum wealth uh, for the people, maximum employment, uh, even if in, in the short term it, it, it may create some uh, some difficulties apparently. So I think what they're doing is to uh, to, f to to ensure that we will return to uh, the target uh, in inflation is the right thing to do. And the, the way they do it, I think, does not impair economic growth. We continue to be uh, growing despite the war in Ukraine, despite the uh, increase in inflation as a result of that, uh, the energy costs, etc., we continue to see a positive economic growth and we continue to see uh, an increase in, in employment. That's especially true for France. If I look at uh, the unemployment rate, it's uh, uh, the lowest uh, for a very long period of time. We just have a, about a minute left, but I'm wondering, some people would point to the images that they see on their screens of protests and, and some of the you know, garbage collection issues and some of the, the pushback that you've seen in Paris, in France. Does that affect any of what you're talking about in terms of the growth and momentum <clears throat> and price stability, for that matter? No, it does not. Uh, it may be uh, a bit remarkable or uh, difficult to understand, but uh, I think there are two, two important remarks uh, I would like to make. One is that it shows that France is serious about continuing its reform agenda. Uh, and second, uh, we, uh, I mean, any reform in the, in the domain of pension uh, system has always been difficult in France. We've always had some resistance, and understandably so. Uh, but in the end, uh, things go on and, and reforms are done and uh, we consolidate the system uh, bit by bit. Um, uh, but what we see is no real uh, change in economic growth. The first quarter is still, uh, still positive and relatively high. Inflation is lower in France than in the rest of Europe, also thanks to uh, uh, good interventions by the government to ensure a cap in uh, in the effect of energy prices for uh, uh, corporates and uh, and households, and um, and um, as I said, uh, unemployment is continuing to decrease. So, so far, so good. Christian Noyer, thank you so much for being here. Christian Noyer, BNP Paribas and Bank of de France honorary governor, thank you so much for being here. Coming up on uh, one, at 1 p.m. Eastern on Bloomberg TV, Thomas Honig, former Kansas City Fed president, former FDIC vice chair, as continued conversations go on in Washington, D.C., particularly with the NABE conference. Janet Yellen speaking this afternoon around 3.45 p.m. We got some released comments from from her talking about the need for more regulation right now in markets, a lift as people reassess perhaps banking crisis over. This is Bloomberg. <laughs>